All right, now we'll formally call today's meeting to order. Would our city clerk please call the roll? Councilman DeCicio. Here. Councilwoman Gallego. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Valenzuela. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Councilwoman Williams. Here. Vice Mayor Pastor. Mayor Stanton. Uh, I am here. Uh, we have an interpreter, Ms. Marquez. Would you please introduce yourself? My name is Leticia Marquez. Si alguien necesita ayuda o traducción al español, por favor, véame. Gracias. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda are citizen comments. Citizens have up to three minutes to provide comments before the City Council on any non-agendized items. We'll do that for up to 15 minutes. If there's additional time or additional cards who have not had an opportunity to uh, speak, those individuals have an opportunity to speak at citizen comment at the end of today's uh, agenda. Our first speaker, Mr. John Rusnick. Mr. Rusnick, please come forward. You have up to three minutes to speak, followed by Ms. Diane Barker. My name is John Rusnick. I want to speak about the dust dustproof lot. It's in my neighborhood, next door to me. It's one thing, I'm a resident, I'm a taxpayer, and uh, I'm a senior citizen, and I'm a veteran. One thing, I've been discriminated against by you people, and I, want, I would like to get it straightened out. I got some information here, and I got more. I'll give it to Chris and let him pass it out to everybody and look and see what I got. Thank you. But one thing, like Felda was up at my place, and she said they made her put a, a driveway up all the way to the back of her property. Well, mine's, my property is 301 feet deep, and the driveway is 81 feet, which is halfway, less than halfway, and doesn't even go in the backyard. The backyard is 6,000 feet, and it's supposed to be no more than 3,000 feet. So, with what everybody's doing is saying, well, they give them a variance. Well, they're not giving them a variance on that lot because they're not doing nothing. They're not changing anything. It's still there, and it's been there ever since I reported it five years ago. So one thing, being discriminated against this by you people, all of you, and uh, DCCO over here, he told me when I met with him, everybody breaks the law. Everybody breaks the law. Well, I'm not breaking the law. It's the city that's breaking the law. That's what that is there. So I think I'm a senior. I should have some rights. Veteran should have some rights. That there should be somebody who would say, look, Let's look at this and find out what's wrong with it. Nobody don't care. You don't care about the honest citizen like myself. The United, it's, it's, uh, I lived there for 44 years. I've lived there. I've built my house. And before that, I rented in Phoenix. So I lived here, paid taxes all these years, and get nothing. Nothing at all from you people. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rosnick. Council CCO, I know he quoted you. If you wanted a chance to right. uh, uh, give uh, your interpretation, please. Well, I want to make sure that the public understands exactly what's occurring. Mr. Rosnick's been bringing this up for at least the last 11, maybe 15 years. It's a complaint against a neighbor that has a three-quarter, no, excuse me, a two-thirds inch rock versus a three-quarter inch rock gravel in their yard. And that's what this debate is about. This is what the concern was for Mr. Rusnick. The city of Phoenix is not going to engage in rock between two neighbors. We're not talking about the driveway now. The driveway was done three times, and it was done wrong three times. And you, you didn't tell him that. It was done three times. All right, thank and you very it's much, still uh, done Mayor, and not Mr. done Rusnick, right uh, we, today. It's, it's not about for back and forth. Yeah. You, in their yard. What about, Rusnick, what about uh, the what had about quoted the you saying that everybody breaks law, and I wanted you to get a chance to correct the record, and then we can move on. Uh, that was really the issue uh, why I wanted to just because obviously we normally can't give substantive comments on citizen comments. Ms. Barker, Diane Barker. 
Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council and public, Diane Barker. I'm in District 7, which is downtown Phoenix, and I just want to say that um, I want to commend our city manager moving forward with the incident of the flooding at Burton Bar. It's unfortunate, but I'd also like in the renovation and in the coming, which may be long term, but short term for this idea, to have an outlet for the Phoenix Police at Hens Park. I was a volunteer for Los um, Noches Blancos on Saturday night, and it went into Sunday morning. And I should have not taken a bicycle there because it was stolen. Also, it was report. I have a police incident report online. Another person online, Facebook, reported that their child's, it was a whole nice rig of a bicycle with the child compartment was stolen from Hans Park. And a park employee said it happens all the time. This has got to stop because it's, the, as for me, it's my mobility to get around town. I use that bicycle, it's folding, it was, to get around many different places and I can take it inside the bus. So in the police report, it says, well, if it's just a bicycle, you go here. Why don't you say bicycle? Because saying just, and I heard a judge, when a man lost his mobility to his work, which was a bicycle, the jet, that was his mobility. So if you take it in perspective, if it's somebody's SUV or what, it doesn't matter. It is their vehicle or their assistance to get for a viable living. Okay, the other thing on a positive, what do we do on Mondays? Yes, I've got some people here for it. And we're having a birthday bash, downtown Phoenix, Fit Phoenix, and the Downtown Phoenix Partnership, all are gonna have a birthday bash at the park. What this is about, every Monday, no matter the climate, or if it's a holiday, we get out downtown. We support downtown, the happenings, the events, the retailers, it's fun. You can walk, exercise, or if you're social, you come there, you get raffle tickets that, we had great seats for the D-backs this year. And uh, they'll have discounts for everybody at the local realtor, uh, the, the restaurants. And it's fun, you make friends. So I'd like to see everybody, I'd like to see more City of Phoenix and our officials and mine and seven come there. And then finally, my friend John Resnick, what's happened is Sal DeCicio, that's why he never went to court. He doesn't want to waste public money talking about a size of gravel. State laws being broken. All right, thank you, Ms. Barker, very much. How about uh, Gao, Ying Gao? Is that the correct uh, Good to see you. And then followed by Charles Kian. Good afternoon, everybody. Honorable Mayor, Honorable Councilman, my name is Ying Xia Gao, and I am an artist. Today, I don't want to say who is right and who is wrong. I don't want to talk about anything about money. When I was a child, I liked to draw flowers, flying birds, rivers, and the mountains. Even if my painting, my drawer was simple, I did them with my heart. I worried every day that the flying birds would disappear. The flowers would die. What worried me more was that my soul for art would be destroyed. I have a very painful experience to share. I married my ex-husband at 27. Sometimes I forgot to cook meals when I concentrated on my paintings. One day, he came home after work. He saw me still work on a painting. He fled up and threw a cup of hot tea onto my painting. 
and told me, no more paintings in our house. After I immigrated to the United States, I saw that Americans loved the art in my daily life. Now, let's go to the Chinese culture center. Those beautiful tiles and those stone statues are real works of art. It took many craftsmen to create those beautiful works of art. Because of money, they may be destroyed. Destruction of art is an unwise decision. As an artist, I beg you not to demolish the artistry created by mankind. Art is not money. Art is a beautiful dream, but this dream can lead us to understand real wealth. Do not let money kill art. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Mr. Uh, Kian, Charles Kian. Honorable Mayor Stanton, Council Members, yesterday, City of Phoenix has issued a permit to True North to allow them to remove and replace roof tiles at the Chinese Culture Center. This is a very serious issue. By knowingly violating a restaurant condominium owner's Proposition 207 writes, this action opens city for legal and financial liabilities. The Chinese Cultural Center is a commercial condominium association with the two owners, True North and the Sichuan Restaurant. As one of the two condominium owners, True North has no legal base to request permit to remove and replace roof tiles for condominium association. For your reference, I have provided here a copy of the CCNR of the condominium association. As the city is well aware the two condominium owners of the Chinese Cultural Center are in a legal dispute, and the court has issued TRO, and the court date was set to this Friday, November the 3rd. The city is also fully aware property owners of Proposition 207 right. By issuing permit to one of the disputing condominium owners city has violated the 207 right of the other owner, namely the restaurant condominium owner. City also demonstrated its discrimination against minority businesses. Given the seriousness of this issue, its legal and financial implications, city needs to investigate its legal and the planning departments to see if proper code of conduct is followed. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And we'll take one more uh, person to testify in citizen comments. And then we will, uh, at the end of the meeting, we'll take the remainder of the individuals wishing to speak. The next speaker will be Mr. Alsup Yang. Ms. Alsup Yang, I apologize. Ms. Yang. Good afternoon, mayors and councilmen. Uh, we are here because we believe ourselves. And then because we love our Chinese culture center, is re represent our ancestors the way they live. And about 2,500 years ago, the philosopher named Lao Tzu, and he's the founder of the religions of a Tao. He influenced us deeply and even confuses 
tip his hat to him. And a great believer is nonviolent. And Lao Tzu teaching us very similar to the Christian belief today. And the true nor doesn't, okay, it's so little, I do. Okay, true nor don't mistake our humbleness to as a weakness. The first time I hear the culture center being so, I was do some research, trying to find out what was true or not. And first, I just thought maybe my favorite store, Ranch Market, it was moving. And I thought, no idea the True North had bought the whole entire property. And how did that happen? I thought part of it is owned by Chinese. The true North doesn't appreciate our culture and disbelieve and try to destroy the center. And I have, I have some important information. I had a, uh, it's concerned about Zoom stipulation number 11. I have facts to a uh, committee already and uh, I got it. And uh, it's something by management inter dot or go no not oh go sorry okay the Chinese people on the Phoenix are working very hard to meet the standard and to the public the art requirement to this uh, stipulation I try practice a lot but I can't get it <laughs> the Chinese Culture Center has a continue over 20 years and uh, maintain the significant art piece and the garden and the community square open to the public. This is not an empty lot to not bought it. It's not a warehouse. You don't need to repair or build or rebuild. The true north for the historic culture center and that is replaceable. I have been many Chinese towns in the United States, they including Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Cal Chicago, and Washington, D.C. None of them is beautiful as Phoenix Culture Center. Phoenix is a multicultural city, and I heard the city plan on the building a Latino culture center Listen up, Latino, you better cross the T and dot the I because carefully read the document because I hate to see you guys have a legal one problem like we did. Maybe down to 10 or 20 years from now. I just don't want you guys to face it. It's just pure agony right now. Now, not too long ago, some of our people demonstration to a, a pop-up events and a true nor is a, a reaction is jack out the price. They've been jacked out so many times in there. The culture center on September 13, they removed a stone lion in front of the ranch market. And I don't know those the statue is damages or not. If they do, we gonna talk about the price and then we gonna bring that down. And furthermore, true nor if you damage the rooftop, when they remove that tile and get down to your level of a taste, we not gonna buy it. And this is not, a, uh, this is not over, this is, is beginning. And I finished my case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yang. All right, we're going to move on in the rest of the um, uh, agenda. And again, uh, additional folks who are here to give citizen comments will have the opportunity at the end of today's meeting. Our next uh, portion of our agenda is the city clerk will read the 24-hour paragraph. The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6370 through 6378. 
S44007 through 44036, and resolutions number 21585 through 21589. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Stark, have you had a chance to review the meeting minutes from the formal meeting August 30th, 2017? Thank you, Mayor. I have, and I recommend approval. Second. There's a motion. There is a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next on our agenda are liquor license recommendations. Vice Mayor, View, do you have an omnibus motion on liquor license recommendations? Motion to approve items 2 through 43 and take item 96 out of order for approval and also accepting items 32, 33 and continuing item 44 to November 15th, 2017. That's our omnibus. There is a second. Any comments or questions? Are there any cards on those items? Uh, just in favor, I see one yellow one. Uh, okay, great, excellent. Uh, so there's a motion in favor and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next on our agenda are ordinances, resolutions, new business. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. 32 and 33. These are items in District 7, Councilman Nowakowski's uh, district. Uh, Councilman, how would you like to move forward? Mayor. Mayor. Please. My name, is, <clears throat> my name is Denise Archibald with the City Clerk Department, and with me is Prosecutor's Office Nathan Watts. Um, it appears that we need item 96 to be approved or acted on by the council first, and then we would move forward with, oh, it was, We sorry. just did 96, and now we're on 32 and 33. Oh, I see, it was a procedural issue that we had to deal with. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so the motion is in favor of 32 and 33. Is there a second? There is a second already. Any cards in the item? Any questions by members of this council? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next on our, on our agenda is ordinances, resolutions, new business, and planning and zoning uh, items. Vice Mayor, do we have an omnibus on those items? Motion to approve uh, items 45 through 120, except the following items, 75, 76, 80, 118, 119, and 120. And excluding these items for public comment is 86 and 88. 86 and 88. All right, uh, that's the omnibus motion. Are there any additional items that a member of this council would like to take out and have for individual vote? All right, there is a motion. Is there a second? We do have a second from Council on Williams. Any questions on those items or any, no cards? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Waring, Williams, Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, so, so that, those items pass unanimously. Next item on the agenda is item number 75. Item number 75 is a proposal to enter into a temporary library uh, location. Um, is there a motion on item 75? Move item 75. Second. There's a motion and a second. Vice Mayor, do you have comments on item 75? I did. I just wanted to. Uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that this is a temporary uh, library location. What I would consider kind of uh, the new term, a pop-up library. Uh, I think uh, we became innovative and creative, and uh, watched our uh, entrepreneurs on how they uh, become, how they do these uh, things in the public. And so uh, I'm, I am voting yes for item 75. Thank you very much. Any additional comments on 75? Councilman, Mayor, please. Uh, I, I also want to thank Sharon Harper, who happens to be here and as a Valley Leadership alum, I know several of us on the council. Sharon was just named the Woman of the Year. And uh, thank you for your involvement on this. And this is important for our city, for our library system. And uh, we wouldn't be able to do this without your support and your help. So thank you so much. All right, thank you very, uh, thank you very much. Any additional comments by members of this council on 75? Ms. Ingley, you, you says you're available, you're in favor, but available to speak if requested. It's up to you whether you want to speak or not. All right, we'll make uh, sure you're noted for the record. Roll call. 
DeCicio? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Stark? Yes. Valenzuela? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Mayor Stanton? Yes, that item passes unanimously. Next item is item number 76. Is there a motion on 76? Move item, Mayor, I asked for item 76 to be pulled, but I got my questions answered, so. So there is a motion for 76. There's a motion 76, is there a second? Second. There is a second. Are there any cards in 76? Any comments or questions by members of our council? Roll call. DeCicio. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. Next item is item number 80. Item number 80 is the proposed uh, uh, dues, I guess, uh, assessments for the Downtown Phoenix Partnership, officially called the Downtown Enhanced Municipal Services District. Is there a motion on 80? Move item 80. Where? Oh, I'm sorry. We have to do a public hearing first. My, my apologies. Okay, so first, before we have a motion, I am going to have a public hearing on item number uh, 80. Okay, so I'm going to open up that public hearing now. Uh, is there anyone here wishing to provide testimony on item number uh, 80? Let's see, Dan Clocky is in favor, if necessary, so I'll leave it up to you whether you want to provide any uh, testimony. Our professional city staff is here uh, as well to uh, talk about their recommendation. Anyone here in the audience wishing to speak on item number 80, which is the Downtown Phoenix Partnership Assessment going once, going twice. Public hearing is now closed. Uh, now I'll turn it to um, Vice Mayor, see if you have a motion on item number 80. I have a motion on item 80, but I also have a question. All right, so motion is for a second. There is a second. Vice Mayor. Um, in reading this packet and being part of the committee meetings, there is a difference in um, what is being asked. And so, uh, Ms. Mackey, if you could please tell, it, tell me what the difference is and how we got to that number. Absolutely, Mayor, Vice Mayor. Um, city properties are assessed in the Enhanced Municipal Services District. And we kind of drew a line in the sand of May 18th as to when those assessments were tallied. Since that time, the city has disposed of the Barrister Building. So we had had an increase out of the general fund budget of $23,000 prior to selling the Barrister Building. With the sale of the Barrister Building, that brings the city's assessment down to approximately $8,000. Should we dispose of the HR Building in the next month or so, that will bring the city's addition down to about $4,000. Because we drove the line, we kind of drew the line on May 18th, we'll adjust in the city budget process through in three plus nine and five plus seven to accommodate for that reduction in the general fund budget. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions by members of this council? All right, roll call. <coughs> DeCicio. No. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, that item passes on a seven to two vote before this city council. Next item is item number 86. Is there a motion on 86? Move item 86. 86? 86 is the next one. Is there, is there a second on 86? There's a second. Mr. Leonard Clark, did you? You know, okay. There's a motion, there is a second. Any comments by members of this council? Roll call. DeCicio. Gallego, yes. Nowakowski, yes. Stark, yes. Valenzuela, yes. Waring, Williams, yes. Pastor, yes. Mayor Stanton. Uh, yes, so that item passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda is item number 88. Item number 88 is analysis and recommendation by our professional city staff as it relates to youth transit passes. This item did go before the transportation uh, subcommittee. Uh, so I'll turn it over to uh, the chair of that subcommittee, Councilman Williams. You have a motion on item uh, 88. Uh, Mayor, this was uh, an item that was researched by five different departments in the city. Uh, we did a cost analysis. We contacted uh, state education, 
uh, schools, etc. And speaking for a council person in the north area who doesn't have bus service, uh, it would uh, seem that uh, this would prevent us getting bus service in the future because of the high cost. And so I am moving the subcommittee's recommendation that we move forward, uh, but we target outreach to school districts and charter schools for the Platinum Pass program, which is available to them, uh, which provides a reduced cost for students. Second. We have a motion. We have a uh, second. Uh, now, are there any cards on item 88? Do I have them? Oh. Leonard Clark, did you provide testimony on 88? And then Ms. Barker, but not wishing to speak, uh, is in favor, uh, I assume it means in favor of what uh, the motion was just made, because that was the recommendation for professional city staff. Mr. Clark, good to see you. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Leonard Clark. I live in beautiful District 1. Great district to live in. And, but uh, I want to say that I'm strongly in support of this. As you know, I'm not a friend of, uh, sometimes a supporter of charter schools, but I don't believe our children should be punished because they're in a charter school or in a public school. Um, I'm an independent thinker, and uh, as a resident, I hate to see our children not being able to, any way, being impeded to get to school. So I hope that you'll pass this. I think this is, uh, if you can support this, even my conservative friends, I think it would go a long ways towards showing that we're, we're not so dysfunctional that we can't agree on some good common sense things. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. I believe that Mr. Clark then is not in favor of the uh, uh, motion made by Councilman Williams, but is instead by the original uh, petition by individuals who came to present this council. Okay, I wanna make sure you had it uh, on the record correctly. Okay, that's all the cards we have on this uh, item. I'll now turn to members of the city council. Are there any comments or questions on this uh, item? Councilman DeCicio, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm one of the original people that supported this proposal going forward. And I'll just at least give this as an outline of why I support an alternative motion. I, I'm okay with the platinum, you know, uh, way we've been doing it in the past, but I don't think it goes far enough. You know, and it, it's, it's just a short history. My parents were both really poor. My dad had a sixth grade education. My dad, my mom had a fourth grade education. Working class people had to be to work, never late. They were always on time. A lot of individuals that have come from working class, even poor families, one of the difficulties that they have is getting their children to school. It just is that way. If there's a school that's challenged in their neighborhood, they should at least have the right and the option to be able to send their children to a school that they believe is in a better school district or at a better location. We have open enrollment. They should be able to do that, whether it's charter school, public school, private school, whatever it is that they need to do. One of the, the blockages for these kids, these children, an inability to get there because their parents work and they just don't always work on the same time. I'm fortunate where I have the ability to take my kids into school. Um, you know, my schedule is my schedule, but a lot of these individuals, a lot of these kids, a lot of these families do not have that same ability. So the idea was allow these children to have free bus passes. Uh, right now, light rail sucks out millions of dollars every year. Light rail. I think it's a waste of money. Uh, the capital expenditures are going to exceed over $200 million a year in the final years. It's just expensive. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical to do that, to spend it on that when we have other kids and other needs in our community that could use this. So from my end of it, I think that there's plenty of money out there. You just have to re-divert those monies to those kids, those children, and those, and those families that need to be able to get their you know, get there in school and be able to pick and choose the schools that they want to go to. And if they choose to go to a better school, let them do that, or at least a perceived better school for that family. It may, it may not be, but that parent, that, that uh, mom or dad, may want to take their kid to a different location. Um, I think some of the people that are here with Madison, you know, we're very blessed to have the Madison School District. Uh, it's known one of the best in the, in the, in the state. But not all school districts are like that, not all school districts are even, and not all districts are fair. And so that was my uh, push. I am not going to support this. I think the continuing program just keeps the status quo. It's okay. I don't think it goes far enough. So I'm not going to support the proposal when, in fact, that these monies could come from something like light rail. Thank you, Mayor. I thank you very much, Councilman. 
Any additional comments or questions by members of our city council? Um, Vice Mayor, please. Yes. Uh, I have a, a question regarding the public schools, uh, transportation. And uh, when my understanding is that uh, at Charter, uh, Charter are considered public schools too, uh, that there is a budget set aside for transportation needs. Mayor Stanton, Vice Mayor Pastor, um, the state does provide funding for both pr um, public as well as charter schools that can be used for transportation costs. And so my understanding in one of the districts here, uh, Phoenix Union High School District, uh, they provide uh, what they call the Platinum Pass, and it's provided to those students that are a mile or more uh, away from their feeder school. Yes, Vice Mayor Pastor, that is correct. Um, we have a long-standing uh, agreement with um, Phoenix Union High School District, um, where they do provide um, the Platinum Pass, or you know what we would probably better call a student youth pass, um, for students who do meet those criteria that they establish. Um, they are eligible to use the cost of the pass um, you, front using their state um, allocation. And. Do charters have the ability to do that also? Yes. Thank you. Are they very much, uh, Vice Mayor? Any additional comments or questions by a member of the council on this item? All right. Uh, the motion was made by Councilman Williams. Roll call. DeCicio. No. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Uh, y yes. Was the motion passes on an eight to one vote of this uh, city council. Next item on our agenda is on the planning and zoning agenda. And that is item number 118. Item number 118 is a proposed zoning matter on the uh, northeast corner of 7th Street and Marlette. Um, there's numerous cards on this item. Yeah. Give me a second just to get them organized here. My understanding is that uh, folks here who are in opposition to the proposal uh, have provided the order in which they wish to speak, and I'll certainly do my best to respect the order that they have requested to speak in. Okay. Oh, these are, these are some additional ones here. They're on the... Yeah, okay. No, I'm sorry, this... Oppose. Okay, uh, so we are gonna proceed by having a staff report given by our planning director. Our planning director and the planning department are recommending in favor of this proposed rezoning. Um, and then we'll see if there's any questions by members of this council for our planning director. Then I'll open up a public hearing. Uh, I'll give the applicant, uh, I guess, how much time does the applicant need? Five minutes, is that enough time? How much time do you need? How much time do you need? What's that? Ten is fine. I'll give the I'll give the same obviously to the leaders of the opposition. Uh, try to be as fair as possible, uh, and then uh, other speakers will have two minutes to provide uh, testimony on uh, whatever they want to say on this item, uh, and then we'll close the public hearing, and then we'll see if there's a motion by members of the city council and a second, and then obviously we'll have a an opportunity for members of the council to speak or ask any questions on this uh, issue. Does any council member want to proceed in a different way than that? All right, so we're gonna now turn it to Mr. Allen Stevenson uh, to provide a staff report as to why you're recommending it and obviously let us know also uh, the recommending bodies uh, before they came to this council, uh, how they voted as well. Mr. Stevenson. 
Thank you, Mayor, members of council. This request. Oh, just a moment here, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, so no problem. Thank you. Ms. Stevenson. Mayor, members of council, this request is to rezone a 3.93 acre site from R4 and R5 to PUD, which is planned unit development to allow a multifamily residential and office development. Staff does recommend approval per stipulations uh, as you stated. You see the subject site here outlined uh, in red uh, right here. This is 7th Street and here is Maryland uh, by way of major cross streets. Um, it, the Kellenbeck East Village Planning Committee recommended approval per the staff recommendation by a 12 to 4 vote. The Planning Commission recommended approval per the Kellenbeck East Village Planning Committee by a 5 to 1 vote uh, as well. You see that this site, um, by virtue of where it's located, is, uh, has its own access point right through this commercial area here out to 7th Street. So the proposed uh, project's traffic accesses 7th Street directly into its parking area and not on the adjacent streets. The proposed zoning that surrounds this site uh, is either commercial C2 here on the west of it to the south and to the east and to the north is a mix of multifamily residential or uh, office development that goes back around to the C2 here. So it does not abut any existing single family residentially zoned properties today. The general plan designation for this parcel also is 15 plus, uh, which is supportive of the uh, intensification of this site as proposed with the PUD. Here is the proposed applicant's uh, site plan, and you see through this the access off Stella that I mentioned directly onto 7th Street. The access point goes in here. Here's the parking garage with it being wrapped by residential uh, all the way around it and the amenities in the middle of the proposed project. Here are the proposed elevations uh, by the applicant is a three and four story uh, project. Uh, and uh, with that, the, there's a maximum building height of 48 feet uh, that is proposed as part of the elevations you see here today. Again, back to, to this site here, because of its location uh, prop, you know, by with its own access point onto 7th Street, not being adjacent to single family residential and the fact that general plan is 15 plus uh, were big reasons why staff was supportive of this proposed uh, rezoning application. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stevenson. At this time, any questions by members of the City Council? Uh, Mr. Stevenson, Councilwoman Stark, please. Thank you. Alan, on page 7 of the staff report, or page 291, um, under land uses, it talks about um, the in intention, if, if it doesn't develop as multifamily, that the approximately 1.15 acre existing easternmost parcel could still develop as office. What happens to the western portion? Does that, that still would be multifamily? It's a little confusing. Mayor, Councilwoman Stark, yes. The uh, existing zoning on that portion uh, is multifamily today, R4A. It would still develop uh, with a multifamily use sometime in the future. Thank you very much, Ms. Councilwoman Stark. Any additional comments or questions at this time for Mr. Stevenson? Okay, uh, so now I'm gonna open up the public uh, hearing. As I mentioned, there are numerous cards uh, on this uh, item. In general, I'm gonna try to go a little bit back and forth uh, to either uh, to some who are in favor, some who are opposed, et cetera. I will try to also respect the request to go in the order um, by uh, folks that have been very active on this case for a long period of time. So with that, I'm gonna open up the public hearing on item number 118. Public hearing is now uh, open. Uh, Mr. Earl, I'll allow you to go uh, first. And then again, for Sandy Grinnell, John Hathaway, Larry Weitzel, Jackie Rich, and Neil Haddad, we'll get, try to give you extra, a little bit extra time uh, to try to make it as fair as possible. And then for everyone else, uh, two minutes of testimony before the city council, please. I'm gonna try and make sure this thing has been loaded. Um, I have a, there, there, there we go. Mayor, members of the council, for your record, my name is Stephen Earle and my address is 3101 North Central Avenue. I am here today in behalf of Wood Partners. Uh, Todd Taylor and Clay <coughs> Richardson are both here with me today. Uh, since there has been a considerable amount of uh, confusing information uh, on the internet about this case, I'd like to set kind of a clear tone uh, for the matter. 
uh, and go through some of the foundational facts. The first mentioned by Alan is this is a blow up of the general plan. The property uh, shown in the star is in the middle of a large body of high density multifamily on the general plan the highest level that the general plan allows. So this proposal is consistent with the general plan. What is west of 7th Street, you'll see, is almost all single family. Uh, east, however, there's quite a diversity of housing from R16 to several different kinds of multifamily categories. This next is the zoning map, and you can see how west of 7th, except for the C2 on the, on the street, is all R110. Uh, so it's a very, um, consistent uh, re single family residential neighborhood. However, on the east, there's upwards of 12 multifamily complexes that are already there, most of which are several decades old. And so it is not a low density neighborhood on the east side of 7th, although it certainly is on the west. And that's kind of the importance of the context. Uh, our yellow project there is surrounded, as Alan said, by R4, uh, R5, um, uh, C2, and uh, CO. That's important to us because we're not next to any single family homes. In fact, most of the homes that are uh, related to this project are more than a football field away. Um, and and this, this is the site plan that Alan showed. Uh, it's been told by several people that we have not uh, negotiated uh, with uh, some of the neighbors. And we just want to make it really clear that in order to get to this site plan, we had to do a number of concessions with surrounding property owners because you see that all the surrounding property owners are either commercial, existing, office, retail, apartments. Uh, and so we met with every single one of those people and they came up with a series of issues they felt were very important for us before we filed the case. Building height, they were not willing to see four stories right out, right out on Marlette. They wanted a three-story buffer going up to four. They wanted setbacks that were not typical of urban projects of seven or eight or nine feet. They wanted 25 feet, which is more suburban in character. They wanted the landscaping to be oasis type, not DG with a few desert plants. They wanted the appearance to be, again, more residential rather than urban. Um, and so we worked on that. They wanted to make sure there was no vehicular access to Marlette because that is viewed as a local street. Um, and so we, that, that was a significant change because the prior project uh, for this site did have direct access to Marlette. And finally, the streetscape needed to be more pedestrian in orientation, not backing units up for the project. So all the things that we did uh, below that to answer those issues none of which were required by the code, but are now all a part of our project. And I can go into that uh, by showing you this. This is what eventually became the rendered perspective of those elevations on Marlette. So every unit has a porch coming with a door coming down to the street. Above that, units above have balconies. Uh, it's red brick for the first two levels. It has uh, offset sidewalk with trees on both sides, planted th a three inch caliper. There is no vehicular access, only pedestrian. This was a, uh, an accumulation of all the things that were requested of us. And then off of 7th, you know, a lot of urban projects are like seven or eight feet away from the arterial. This one's 205 feet back because of where the property is located. So it does not have a presence out on the major street. It's significantly behind that with the commercial in front of it. We were then told that you haven't shown us that you deserve a PUD because the project isn't superior. We beg to differ. Uh, we think that this project has a number of elements that are not required by code and would not be in your normal uh, conventional zoning categories. All the parking is completely internalized instead of having just asphalt uh, parking. Uh, it has uh, a, a bicycle system which is not required. It has 70% of all the parking is covered uh, it has luxury level finishes inside and out. It has five amenities instead of one. Uh, you can see all these things that we've uh, put that are all not required by code, including the offset sidewalk, the lack of access, the ground level units having porches, second and third levels, uh, first and second levels being brick and stone, um, uh, and then the articulation of the building, significant articulation. In addition to all of that, we have embraced green technology. There's over a hundred different 
uh, green technology features of this village, building, which are part of the sustainability, including high energy uh, lighting, uh, energy star appliances and construction techniques, uh, drip irrigation, and, uh, and a whole lot more. So what did that all result in? Everything in green has signed a statement of support for this project, completely surrounding the project on all four sides. In addition, we concentrated our effort you can see where our red property there is. We have over 236 documented supporters of this case that have signed letters of their own or statements of support that have been delivered to the city. In addition, there are a number of people here today, I don't know how many cards have been turned in, but my guess is it's close to 40, that have all come down and made the effort to be supportive, and that's because we concentrated right in the area. Some of our supporters are west of 7th, most of them are east of 7th. We were told that height was just gonna be towering above everything in the area. So we took a series of photographs and put the building into the photograph. These are taken from Maryland looking southwest. This is a little farther down Maryland. Again, you can see where the building just barely tops over the existing buildings. This is where the school is, the uh, Madison School. And again, you can barely see the building that distance away. This is, the next one is, uh, oops, excuse me. That one's Marlette, again, the building is there, shown there, and that's with the trees at planting, not uh, in a few years, they will virtually cover up the buildings. We were then told that you're completely out of character with the heights of the buildings in the area, and while we agree there's not thousands of them or even tens uh, or twenties of them, there are a number of buildings along 7th that are three and one four-story building. So what we're doing here is not out of character with the east side. Now the west side, you'll see, there's really only one two-story building. So it's again a difference between the east and west. This is the four-story building south of us down by uh, Missouri. These are apartments uh, that are on uh, 7th Street. This is the building just to the south of us, a Rose, where it's a, the West Star Entertainment Building, which is monolithic in size and it's existing. It's there as part of the existing character. This is Odera, a multifamily complex, just two streets south, two or three streets south of us. That's three stories uh, close to the road, and the landscaping, same, same project, almost covers it up. This is a project built under, and I'm not trying to pull this out as a, a quality, a, concept. In fact, what I'm suggesting is this is built under R5 normal standards. The thing I'd like to draw to your attention is that the, the landscaping is DG with desert plants. There's a flat surface, none of the units face the street, uh, monolithic in character with very little articulation. That's what can be built under the current standards without what we're doing, which is this. We humbly believe, notwithstanding the criticism that might be leveled by those who oppose it, that it's a beautiful project. Uh, now, inside of the project, the internal elements are at the very highest level. People who will be renting here uh, have income levels at the $100,000 uh, per year level. They're paying $1,500 to $3,000 per month in rent in order to get these kind of amenities. And the shift in the, in the uh, paradigm of housing is that those in the millennial generation really like to see a uh, a beautiful project like this, and they don't want necessarily to have homes. That's the new paradigm. And so these are the kinds of interior facilities they have, beautiful facilities, uh, living rooms, TV rooms, fitness facilities. And then these are the interior of the units with uh, quartz countertops, plank flooring, all the uh, appliances like condominiums. So again, we think this project really does uh, have high value that is far beyond what would normally be in code. Uh, and the last issue I want to talk about is traffic. We've been told that this will, we've heard words like overwhelm, you know, terrible, life-threatening. We have about 1.7% more traffic this project will create than what's already permitted under existing zoning, given the fact that 7th Street carries 30,000 trips per day. Uh, we agree that we have over a thousand trips per day that will be here, but that's over a 24 hour period. In the peak hour, when people really care about traffic, we have about a hundred. Uh, and, and so we did a gap study because people said, you just can't make that turn. Well, we humbly believe you can because of the signal that you see at, the, at Maryland on the north, which is 500 feet away from our turn, and um, Rose on the south. Those, those uh, 
signals turn red for through traffic approximately every minute, and they turn red for about 35 seconds. So in that period of time, you have enormous amount of traffic that can get out. Uh, we actually had a video of a drone that we put up there for a whole uh, hour, and actually two hours, to, to show all the traffic so you could see it yourself to evidence it, but we've run out of time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Earl, for that uh, uh, testimony, and obviously he'll be available for questions uh, by members of this uh, council. So now I'll turn it over to other speakers who wish to provide testimony before this council. Sandy Grinnell, did you provide testimony? And then followed by John Hathaway. Could we leave this up, this graphic up? Thank you. Please. I do have some handouts. May I approach? Yes, our city clerk will come grab them from you. Thank you. Um, Mayor Stanton, we have an update on online petitions opposed to this. We're at 640, and it keeps going up. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sandy Gruno. I am with the Phoenix Mid-Century Modern Neighborhood Association. I'm very pleased to meet many of you. I've met your staff members during the week and um, um, felt good about it. I really did. Uh, you have some really bright people that are working for you. Um, that's how you can get everything done that you do do. I, um, I want to tell you about the Mid-Century Modern Neighborhood Association. We are from Glendale to Bethany Home Road, 7th Street to 12th Street. So this is definitely in our wheelhouse, so to speak. We are a neighborhood of older, mature homes. Uh, my family's lived in this neighborhood since 1925. Certainly, we have seen a lot of changes. And when Madison MTA came in, we were very pleased to see that. We do not embrace the PUD. What you need to know is joining our neighborhood association is Arcadia Osborne Neighborhood Association, Echo Mountain, Levine Citizens for Responsible Development, Madison Neighborhood Association, Medlock Historic Neighborhood, Murphy Trail Estates, North Central Phoenix Homeowners Association, The Peak Neighborhood, Phoenix Historic Neighborhood Coalition, Oakland Neighborhood, um, Okatia Glen, Rancho Ventura, Windsor Square, Marco Deniza, Resident Council. So they are all joining us. Who are we? We are mothers, we are fathers, we are singles, we are families. Some of us work at home, some of us work away, and some of us are retired. Uh, we are children just learning to walk. We are students using local public or religious schools in this neighborhood. In a moment, I'll show you where those are. We are grandparents loving our children and our grandchildren, of course. We are people of many faiths living in this mid-century community we call home. We are also people proud of our diversity, business owners and or employees, good neighbors supporting local businesses. We are children and families endangered when cars rush through a neighborhood to avoid 7th Street. And one incident recently occurred just two weeks ago at 7th Street in Rose Lane. A child was hit by a car. Thankfully, he rolled over the top of the car, and it was strictly a concussion. And more and more of those, now that that has come to be, people are coming forward saying, yes, my child was hit here, my child was hit there, my husband was walking with our child and we were hit. Um, we are also people that jog and walk in the neighborhood. Keep in mind, we have rolling curbs with gutters. We do not have sidewalks in the vast majority of this area, and I'm talking Glendale to Bethany Home Road. So this requires us to use the street when we're out walking. Where are we now? I've never used this before, and I should have probably asked. Um, oops. OK, how do I make it do something, <laughs> guys? Someone. Thank you. The one that says forward? I just want to 
point up there. Oops. The one that was up there. Is there a, a pointer, though? I saw uh, Mr. Earl using it. Got it now? Does this technical difficulty take away from my time? No, it doesn't. Thank no, you. Please, don't worry about that. Okay. Okay. Um, I was hoping not to. Um, so up in the corner, it's not going to work, correct? <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's all right. Up in the corner um, at 7th Street, and the, the main street down there is 7th Street. I think everyone realizes that. But up in the corner, uh, to your to your left, there are two religious schools there, and there is also a synagogue. Actually, there are two synagogues. If we come further down 7th Street, closer to what we call Upward Foundation, is it going to work? Oh, the green button. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so we have synagogues here. We have a religious school right here. We also have um, down here by Upward Foundation, uh, we have another synagogue here. Uh, we have a mikvah over in this area, which is a, a, a woman's uh, spiritual bath. Uh, we have the school over here. If, if the map went further, we've got Rose Lane over here. We've got a lot going on in this neighborhood. That's what I'm trying to tell you. There's a lot going on, and we have a lot of people on foot. We have a large Jewish community center, a uh, large Jewish community, rather. And so uh, these cars going in and out of the neighborhood are a real problem. So now we're going to put uh, quite a few cars going in and out of Stella Lane. But you know what? They're going to have to get on to where they work, where they play, whatever. And that's going to put even more hardship in this neighborhood. And as I mentioned before, we have had quite a few people that are now coming forward saying they, um, they have, they have um, been injured. Um, one thing I did want to say, there was a, um, a screen up that showed all these people that were absolutely in favor. Well, I will tell you that that is a very misleading screen. Uh, right here, I have a gentleman, Mr. Melton probably can't hear me because he's hard of hearing. He has a, a Navy hat on. They showed him as being one of the people that agreed to this. Mr. Melton has not agreed to this. Mr. Melton is vehemently opposed to this PUD. So please don't fully believe what, what was shown to you earlier. I'll go further. Um, let me tell you what we are not. We are not statistics, but we're real people living in this mid-century modern neighborhood. We are not people who are used to being told what to think, what we need, how our neighborhoods should be, and that's exactly what happened at these neighborhood meetings. We were never given an opportunity. No one asked us, what do you think would be best? Mr. Earl talked about sitting down with all these people before he put his plan together. Well, guess what? Why would, what is the reason for the neighborhood meetings? It's to do just that. And all he did was say no, no, when we said we wanted to compromise, or if there's room to compromise, would you come down one story? We are a three-story neighborhood, not a four-story neighborhood. So we, we really have, um, I, I really take, I'm not happy about that comment. Um, one more thing I wanted to bring up were the traffic studies. The first traffic study was conducted the week of Easter. People are out of town. The snowbirds have already left. Um, school is out on spring break. That's not, that's not representative of the neighborhood when you do it during that time. The second traffic study, that was even better. That was done the last day of school, early dismissal, like noontime, for the kids. And again, the snowbirds are no longer in town. Most people have already gone on vacation, and that was the week of Memorial Day. So what I want to say here is, if you, if you want to develop a plan, you need to compromise. But it takes two to compromise. And we were never included in this plan. Thank you. I thank you very much for your uh, testimony. Uh, John Hathaway, did you provide testimony as well? Please. City Council also. Uh, 
Good afternoon. Thank you. My, my name is John Hathaway, and uh, I am a, a close resident of this area. I live about four blocks away. And contrary to what you've heard from Mr. Uh, Mr. Earl, we are not opposed to development of this property at all. We fully support development of the property. We fully support uh, the businesses in the area. We fully support the growth of this, this area in general. We oppose the doubling of the density of this existing property. And we oppose being railroaded by an out-of-town developer. Now, this property is, represents, under its current zoning, it, it establishes about a density of about 130 units on this, on this property. The PUD proposes to go to 255. That's a 96% increase. That's virtually doubling the density of this property. It doubles the number of units. It doubles the number of people. It doubles the number of cars. And any time you double something like that, any time you cram more people, more cars, more units into the exact same space, things probably won't get better. If you put more than, uh, if you double the number of seats on a city of bus, it's not going to be very comfortable. If you double the number of tables in your favorite restaurant, it's not going to get better. It's, it stretches credi credulity to believe that, that this could actually improve the neighborhood in going from 130 to 255. It just won't work. Now, the PUD has two different components. The, 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 the requirement to, generate, to go to a PUD has two components. Number one, it's got to be a superior build environment for everybody, not just the developer, not just the residents of the new units, but everybody, the, the, the neighbors also. And the second component is that it has to be go beyond what is currently zoned. It has to go uh, provide something beyond conventional zoning. And this developer has failed to, to demonstrate that, that what he's doing is good for everybody. All of these aesthetic things that he has, he's pointed out, all of the elevations, all of the setbacks, all the sidewalks, all the vegetation, all of that is possible under current zoning. None of it, absolutely none of it, not one item is prohibited <coughs> under current zoning. Everything is allowed. It's just a matter of intent. So there is absolutely nothing that is, that is prohibited under current zoning. Now, I am, by profession, a statistician with the largest real estate lender in the country. So I'm going to actually shift into numeric mode here. I'm going to talk a little bit about statistics, and I hope I won't bore the hell out of you. But this unit is, uh, this, this uh, property is currently zoned at approximately 35 units per acre. Now, Mr. Mr. Earl indicated that, that this, according to the general plan, this is 15 and up units. What he failed to tell you, what he neglected to tell you, is that this is 35 and below. And this, what, is that a button that, okay. It's 35 and below. There is nothing within a one mile radius of this property that's greater than about 38 to 40, as best I can tell. He's asking for 63. There's nothing a mile away that's greater than 40. The closest property that is at or near this density is a mile and a half away, south on, on 7th Street at the, the southeast corner of Camelback and 7th Street. It's a property called Alta Camelback. That's another Wood Partners property. That's the closest thing that's comparable. North of this property, if you go all the way to the city limits on the 7th Street corridor, there's nothing above 32 units per acre. Not one property greater than 32 units per acre, seven or eight miles north of this property. This is a density island. Now, statistically, the average density of the properties within about a half mile radius is nine. Nine units per acre. And the standard deviation is seven. I, I, I hate to, to bore you with the statistics. This property at 63 units is eight standard deviations away from the neighborhood average. Statisticians call that delta, that difference, that deviation from the average, they call it a gross outlier. It's a condition in which that property cannot possibly be, be considered to be that of, like that of the, the, the population, the underlying population. The prob it, 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 to, to say it is, is a one in 200 billion probability. So, so, so to say it's like the surrounding neighborhood is a one in 200 billion uh, likelihood. 
And that likelihood, if you statistically, that's like running into a nine foot tall man while you're running down the street. Just to give you the, 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 uh, the, the, the magnitude of that change. Imagine running into a nine, nine foot man certainly stands out as being different, as being not part of the neighborhood. That kind of rings a bell. So, so Mr. Earl has t tells us we've, he's got all of these aesthetic characteristics, all of these, these amenity characteristics that are appropriate to this, to this property, and that's true. But you can't take a nine-foot man and put sunglasses and a wig on it and say you won't notice it. They stand out. This property will stand out like a sore thumb in this neighborhood. It's, not, it's eight standard deviations away. It's a gross outlier. Now, how do we get to this point? How, how are we at the point where a, a, a developer is proposing more than doubling the density of any property in the neighborhood? Let's see if I can. These properties here, these are, these are, this property here is called Maryland Greens. That's got a density of 29 units per acre. This property over here, it's called Spiral Gardens. That's got a density of 27 units per acre. That's less than half. And there's nothing. If you go out three quarters of a mile in this direction, if, excuse me, if you go, oops. If you go out, the closest property to this that has a density greater than 40 is over here. See where they... The closest property, I can't even point low enough, it's, it's down under the floor, in ter south of here. The closest property that's even close to this is in the floor. There's nothing of this density in this area. And the one thing that, they, that, that Mr. Uh, uh, Earl has not compromised on, he might have compromised on a lot of those aesthetic characteristics, but he has been unwilling in any way, shape, or form to, to compromise on density. He specifically told us, this is what we need, this is what we, we want, we're not playing any games, and we're not going one unit lower. So how do we get to this point where a, 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 a doubling of the density is being asked for? This is a fundamental, a catastrophic failure of the planning process. The city plans, the village plans, the ordinances themselves were ignored during the consideration of this. They were completely ignored. And people looked at that nine foot tall man with the sunglasses and the wig on and said, hey, he's a good looking guy. And we stepped back and said, but he's nine feet tall. How can you ignore that? And yet they did ignore it. If you've got a plan and you invested a lot of time, money and effort in developing that plan, you better follow it. If you've got ordinances that legally obligate an applicant to, to go through certain steps to demonstrate, to objectively demonstrate the need, you've got to enforce that. And these plans and these ordinances were not followed. They were ignored. And I, I think you guys are in a very difficult position. We should not be here, you should not be forced to make this decision. You should not be able to be forced to pick winners and losers in this battle. You should not be forced to pick between a, an Atlanta-based developer and your constituents. And I don't, I, don't, I don't see that that's gonna be a very comfortable thing for you to do. Thank you. I right, thank you very much uh, for that testimony. Um, Larry Weitzel. I also have a handout for the council. Please, thank you. <clears throat> Mayor Stanton and council members, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to present to you today. Um, I'm Larry Whitesell. I'm the co-chair of the, uh, the Peak Neighborhood Association. I live in the area, and um, I uh, have two main points uh, to make today. One of the charts, uh, or one of the pieces of paper that I've given you is a traffic flow uh, issue. My main concern is that of traffic safety for the pedestrians and the automobile traffic that is in the neighborhood on these residential streets. You've heard that the only access point, egress and, and well, in and out is on Stella Lane to 7th Street. That's absolutely true. 
that causes a problem. Remember that 7th Street has reverse lanes. So in the morning, there are more lanes going south than there are going north. The light at Maryland is a control uh, light, that's for sure. Uh, we heard in another meeting that it took Mr. Earl 46 seconds to turn left onto 7th Avenue or 7th Street from Stella Lane during rush hour. That's great for one car, but cars don't come one at a time like they're entering the freeway at a controlled, at a controlled light. They come in bunches, in clusters, like the lines at grocery stores. You've probably in a been in a grocery store. When you walked in, there was no one in line at the checkout. When you, walk, when you are ready to check out, you hear the announcement, manager, uh, th uh, three's a crowd is the one I'm used to hearing. So that's what happens, traffic clusters. And so the more traffic out of these 420 parking places that tries to leave during morning rush hour traffic and tries to turn left, they're going to have that 46 seconds multiplied by the number of cars that are waiting to leave. Traffic is like water. Drivers will find the path of least resistance. Once they've waited in line at Stella and, and 7th, they're going to turn right. And they're going to turn right again on Maryland there is no other street until 10th Street for them to access. That puts them right in the uh, neighborhood, right on the street of the Madison Traditional Academy. That's a safety issue. Then they'll turn right again, go down to, to uh, Rose Lane, which is not on the map, and then there is a light there. That is the way the traffic is going to flow. Mr. Earl has not told you, he probably didn't have time, that they've identified the employment centers, the major employment centers, being south of this property. So the millennials, the $100,000 plus salary people who will be working, are going to be working in those employment centers according to the developer's uh, information. So everyone's going to be going, most people are gonna be going south. Those who are going to work in the Camelback and 24th Street area are going to continue on Maryland to 12th Street, turn right, and that's going to put them right in front of Rose Lane Elementary School. So we have two major public schools that are going to be impacted by these 250 units. Re realize we're not talking 250. We're really talking the difference between 130 and 250. So we're talking an additional 120 vehicles uh, potentially accessing the residential streets because it will be difficult to get out onto 7th Street. My second point is on the map um, that you have that has dots on it. It has a, it's a second page. It has a yellow area that has hatch marks. You're going to hear today, I assume, because I see them in the crowd, from uh, restaurant owners who own restaurants in this area as well as uh, in other areas, and they're going to tell you that this project is essential to their success. They need these, these residents to support their restaurants, and we agree. We love their restaurants. I eat there all the time. But the difference between 120 uh, units and 100, or 255 units is not that great. What I've shown you on the map is uh, where the Marlette project is, and the circles are other PUDs that are either current, where they're all uh, high density uh, residential apartments or uh, owner occupied units that are either currently on the market or that are currently under development. Uh, shovels in the ground, walls going up, or in the planning stages. The ones that you see on the chart on the third page that say complete, that means that all of the plans are complete and things are moving forward. Those represent 1,600 units within a two-mile area of, this, of the restaurant row of 7th Street. So these uh, restaurant owners are, are going to benefit not only from 130 residents or units in this, in this uh, complex, but also from the 1,600 other units within two miles, and that doesn't include a five-story hotel that's planned at 28th Street and Camelback. So there's significant increase in the number of people who are going to be able to support the local businesses. One other point I'd like to make quickly, 
Uh, when Mr. Rule talked about negotiating with the surrounding property owners, realize those property owners are all the business owners. He did not negotiate with any of the neighbors that live on Maryland uh, between 7th and 10th or any other uh, residents. The property owners were business owners. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. The next speaker will be Mr. Keith uh, Mishkin. Um, he, uh, he, I believe he's in favor of the project. And then after that will be Jackie Rich. Thank you. I also have a hand up. Thank you. Honorable Mayor Stanton and City Council, my name is Keith Mishkin. I live in the Biltmore. I'm a local real estate broker, own a company called Cambridge Properties, and I sell a lot of homes in the immediate area, particularly in North Central. Um, according to the Business Journal as well last year, uh, my team was the top five team here in the Valley. I have zero financial stake in this project or with any of the principals, and I own property in the immediate area, and I was copied on some opposition emails, which then precipitated my support here today. So uh, with all the incredible work that has taken place by the council and local developers in creating all this new incredible energy with these restaurants and this retail all along the 7th Street corridor, it's created a tremendous amount of demand for buyers to come into the area and for, aff for affluent tenants as well to come into the area. And I receive these calls almost on a weekly basis from prospective uh, buyers and tenants. And so um, this is also, it's these affluent tenants that are going to become the future buyers in this area and continue to support all the new retail uh, that was, has been created there. Uh, the look of the current project and uh, the height is all within the, the actual zoning, the current zoning. So there's no change in that. And I thought this developer specifically came in and did a brilliant job as well with hiding the cars inside the community. It's a better design. So what I have in front of you is a, is a study that I did for a different developer earlier in the year, uh, which showed the effect of luxury new apartments on home values in similar neighborhoods. I gave you all a copy of that. And this shows in the last five years in Maricopa County, values went up from the deep recession to uh, today, $90,000. In the communities that had luxury class A apartment communities like this, they went up between 106 and 183,000 in very, very similar areas. So that was an average of 143,000, a 50% increase. I strongly and vehemently support this community and the brilliant design that they've done. I thank you very much uh, for your testimony, Mr. Uh, Mishkin. Uh, next speaker will be Ms. Jackie Rich. Yeah, you can cut through. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, he'll, uh, he'll, yeah. Mike will help you out. Uh huh. Go for it. Mr. Mayor, um, Vice Mayor, members of the council, I want to ask very quickly do you have Mary Crozier's name on there? She was one of the. I, well, I have a sticker that has a list of names that asking to go in that order so i'm trying to be as respectful oh, okay. as possible and do but that she's in there well she's certainly in this pile with others who have donated time to her so okay okay mary Thank will have a fair opportunity to speak i thought i was uh attempting to follow the requested order of uh, some of the it, it, i appreciate leaders, it thank you good to see you okay um ladies and gentlemen um i am a almost 30-year resident of um, the neighborhood that is about half a mile from the site of, of the proposed zoning. And um, I raised my family there. We really love the neighborhood, and we love our neighbors. And that's probably how I fell into becoming the person that sends the emails. Um, I think it was my email that Mr. Mishkin somehow got a hold of. Um, he's not on my email list. but. Um, I send emails, um, I've been doing it for the last 15 years, and um, it's generally by word of mouth. Now I have about 900 neighbors on my email list. Um, they're in three different council districts. Um, and um, we are also connected with other individuals who also send emails. So we have a very robust um, email network. Um, 
And so, of course, I sent things out about what goes on in the neighborhood, and I sent things out about um, what was happening with all the meetings in this particular zoning issue. And um, I received about 50 um, people who commented on it. Um, all except one were very concerned about it. Some people were upset. Some people were outraged. Um, and so um, I want, wanted to let you know about that. We did have one person who was in favor of it, and I want him to be noted as well. Um, basically, I think one of the concerns that has not been addressed is the massive size of this project. It's basically like a big box store that is going to be put into our apartment. It's a block and a half wide, and it's taller than the tallest building that we have in our neighborhood. So I just want to leave you with that thought and urge you to vote no. I right, thank you very much for your uh, uh, testimony, Ms. Rich. Uh, the next speaker, uh, let's see, I'll switch over to this side, will be, how about uh, Danny Huval? Did you wish to provide testimony? Hello, I'm Danny Huval, and I own two homes, one on 3rd Street and one on 12th Street in this community. I'm in favor of this project for the following reasons. This will increase the value of my two homes. This will attract high-end renters. The amenities and the features are luxury and unique. There will be mature landscaping that enhances my neighborhood. And they will be using quality finishes that complement the neighborhood. And for those reasons, I highly recommend this project pass. City Council. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, the next speaker will be Neil Haddad, followed by Michael, uh, is it uh, Kuzaroff or Huzaroff? I apologize. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. And my name is Neil Haddad. And um, so you heard a bunch of things. I want to give you some, uh, some uh, <laughs> uh, shorthand for things so we don't have to spend more time on it. So I want you to remember the nine-foot man, the nine-foot man with a wig and with glasses, completely out of character. I also want you to remember eight miles to the north. Eight miles to the north is um, Moon Valley, where that's where the next most dense apartment building is. And again, PUDs are supposed to be in character with the neighborhood. That does not make sense. So if you vote for it, you're voting for the nine-foot man. The, um, we still have not heard why. Mr. Earl has told us that he wants it, that, his, uh, uh, that the developer, Atlanta-based Wood Partners, is asking for it. They have not demonstrated why. They have demonstrated that they are doing it, that they think it can fit. There is no why to this. Um, I want to uh, talk about support for a minute before you received uh, this um, uh, online uh, petition with comments that is now over 650, and I encourage you to just flip through the comments and see that these are individualized comments that are people that are familiar with this case. Mr. Earl referenced something about uh, there being confusing information on the internet. I don't know if Mr. Earl has anything on the internet about this uh, case, but I can tell you that anything that the neighbors sent out is accurate, and we are prepared to provide counsel with copies of those emails that we sent out that people responded to, as well as the petition. Um, you have received individualized letters to your offices. You have received multiple calls. You are aware of 15 different neighborhood associations across the entire city in every um, district. A Couple other things we talked about, Mr. Earl talked about finishes before. A finish is not a benefit, it's a feature. It looks nice. It doesn't make a difference. We just heard about uh, luxury apartment, uh, uh, luxury uh, apartments, buildings, and uh, suggesting that the correlation to nearby uh, homes goes up 106 to 180. We have nothing other, 
there's no correlation. You need to know the contextual information of where that is, what property is around it, what other features are near there. This does not acknowledge any of those things. This is a random one piece of information survey on that. Um, you know, uh, before when Mr. Earl uh, talked about, um, uh, you know, he said that we heard about life-threatening situations, and I'm sure that he was not commenting about on October 18th. Uh, he wasn't considering the, the person, the kid, 12-year-old kid that got hit by the car in the middle of the day and went over the car. Um, the, um, I want to say something about what the businesses are saying and restaurants. We understand that businesses are important, and we support those businesses, and we have supported those businesses for decades. There are people here that have been eating at those restaurants, taking their cars for service, at the people that are here to speak or have submitted cards tonight for 20, 30, 40 years. But all we heard is that it needs to be built. It's like a light switch. It's not like a light switch. It's more like a dimmer switch. We don't go from 15 plus up to 65. What is the next? Up to 200? Up to 300 density units? You're, if you vote for it, you're voting for the light switch, on or off. If you want to consider the way it should work, you will have a compromise with the neighbors, which <clears throat> let's talk about process just for a second. These people have become zoning experts in the past five months. I am not sure that that is their preferred avocation. To spend all this time going to neighborhood meetings, asking questions, going to the uh, village planning committee, which you've all gotten feedback on, and if you have not gotten that feedback, you've willfully ignored that feedback. It was awful. It was awful. The planning commission issues there as well. So the process is not in favor of the neighbors. So. Um, I guess the big thing, and then I, I, I guess I'd like to follow up too. We talk about all these restaurants on 7th, 7th Street. So many people, including successful chefs and the Republic's restaurant critic Dominic Armato, believe that Phoenix has become oversaturated with restaurants, actually doing harm to existing establishments. To wit, one of the slides that Mr. Earl has shown at previous uh, uh, meetings, neighborhood meeting, village planning committee, planning commission, it was all these restaurants on 7th Street. So June 27th of this year, uh, chef and restaurateur Silvana Salcido Esparza is closing Barrio Obrano, her breakfast, lunch, dinner com concept at the yard on 7th Street on Thursday, June 29th. Salcido Esparza told the Republic on Tuesday of that week, I knew it was coming. 7th Street is imploding on itself. It is too much for the area. Based on all these issues, overwhelming density increase, the nine-foot man, out of character with the neighborhood, eight miles to the north. The applicant's refusal to compromise. This was five times we asked publicly, we asked at the village planning committee, at the planning commission, even after let me just say this about Mary Crozier. After the planning commission, Mary Crozier from North Phoenix, uh, North Central Phoenix Neighborhood uh, Association, asked Mr. Earl why he had not called her back. He said, after the planning commission one month ago, I'll call you tomorrow. I don't think you've gotten a phone call yet. It's not the way to do business. We want to work. We want this thing to build. This can happen. We offered up a compromise at the Planning Commission. It was either ignored or, or refused. Let's talk about it. We're still ready to talk despite all this. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. All right, thank you, uh, Neil. Uh, next, let's see, uh, next speaker will be Michael, is it Huseroft? Is that correct? That's what the nuns used to say. No, oh, darn it. <laughs> My name is Mike Huskrath. 
I live in Moon Valley. I don't live near the property. I have no interest in the area as far as real estate holdings. I don't work for a major real estate national corporation, but I have an appraisal company. And I didn't, have, I didn't do any study on the subject property. I know there's a number of properties like this, 7th Street and Camelback, 16th and Highland. We can go on and on. You know, as far as traffic goes, anytime you build anything that has a little bit of substance to it, traffic is going to increase. I live in Moon Valley, and I go somewhere different every day. I go down 7th Street, 16th Street, 17, 51, Tatum. They're all busy. I'm not saying that something like this doesn't increase traffic, but it's busy no matter where you're going. I decided to look at two projects that were similar, at least in numbers, and just see what happened the year after they were built. The first one was at 16th and Morton. It was 225 units, four stories, similar type product. Different neighborhood to a degree because it's a little newer and it has more office and not as much retail. But what I did was start and extend a year from the completion time and see what values did. I drew a neighborhood boundary. I didn't just select a zip code. I used the 51 and 7th Street as uh, boundaries and then I went up to Northern and down to Bethany Home. I needed to have enough statistical information so that I could at least find a trend. And if I centered right around the project, there wasn't enough data. In that particular area, in that, over that time period for all types of real estate product, there was appreciation over that year period of 12%. That was just one minor one. I think the one that's more important is to, I looked at the one at 16th and Highland. There's a brand new project. There's one under construction. There's a total of almost 600 units, or more than two times what we have here at 7th Street. I drew a boundary from, again, using 51 and 7th Street. I went from Camelback South to Thomas. Over that year period, from September of 16 to September of 17, real estate appreciated 8%. Now, it's not a defined way of doing things, but I almost expected if these were such bad things to have in an immediate micro market, I might have seen a decline, and I didn't see that. It's just one way of looking at this, but you know, they seem to be coming up all over the place. I have young kids, they're in their 30s. So it is what the millennials like to enjoy, and you know, it's a wave. And uh, as far as zoning, things like that, I don't have an opinion on that. Thank you. I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Huzeroff, for your uh, testimony. Ms. Mary Crozier is next, and followed by Patrick Birch. Hello, I'm Mary Crozier, president of the North Central Phoenix Homeowners Association. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'd like for you to get the handout before I begin because you're going to need to look at it. Um, and this is just a simple bar chart. Uh, currently, there are three um, Alta projects, the Wood Partners projects in the city of Phoenix. Two are completed, one is under construction. But what you'll see is that uh, the one at Thomas which is 3rd Street and Thomas, is uh, 225 units, 5.91 acres. Uh, that was built in an infill district in the walkable urban code. It was also part of the downtown code. The land was underutilized, blighted. It was a great addition to the city. The next one is uh, Alta Fillmore, 230 units on 4.1 acres, both more acreage than what we're talking about today, less units. That was also infill, downtown code, uh, and that property was just recently sold last week uh, to an out of the country, a Canadian investment firm. Wood Partners broke ground on that in September 2015, so less, two, less than two years later, the property was flipped. Uh, Alta Camelback is under construction now at 7th Street and Camelback. Those of you who travel, that's the area where that uh, one lane has been closed since January for uh, construction. Again, this is in a high-rise density core. It's in an infill area. It's in the downtown code. It's five stories tall. 
And the developer's narrative was really interesting. I read through all of them, and they said the reason for massing the four and five stories were to complement the commercial retail offices, and the height is consistent with the immediate area. And the narrative also states that this is located in the most heavily traversed roadways in the city. So now we look at Alta Marlette. Um, and what Mr. Earl failed to mention is this isn't part of the downtown code. It's not part of the high-rise incentive area. It's not part of the walkable urban code, and it's not part of the infill map. This is clearly spot zoning. There is no reason for the massiveness of this. We don't have adjacent high-rise co office complexes. There's no nine-foot man for miles. Um, and the height and density is not consistent with the immediate vicinity, which you keep hearing over and over again. Stella Lane and Marlette are two lane roads. They are far from being the most heavily traversed roads in the city. Traffic. We're concerned about traffic safety. We're a growing city. There will be more traffic. We know that. But the city of Phoenix, the traffic experts in the traffic department, estimates that an apartment has 10 veh vehicular trips a day. 255 units, that's another 2,550 trips that will be coming out of Stella onto 7th Street. And I don't know of any traffic study that says more cars means less accidents. Wood Partners, who's based in Atlanta, is a national developer. They have an apartment complex product, and they've been successful in building the same thing over and over again, not only in our city, but in cities across the United States. But picking up a product that is clearly zoned for downtown, high density, high height area, and plopping it in the middle of a unique, very unique, low profile, one of a kind, mature section of the city is irresponsible. And quite honestly, I'm astounded that this wasn't stopped at planning and development. And I hope Alan can agree that we have a very good relationship, as I do with most members of planning and development. But have we gotten so focused on getting money streams into our city that we've lost sight of who we are as a city? Do we want to become another Detroit or Houston and just blindly build without any thought to character, integrity, community pride? Why are we just rubber stamping these big box, high density apartments in areas where they're really not zoned? It's zoned for 15 plus, but it's a big jump to go from 15 plus to 66 units per acre. To the business owners that support this, guess what? So do we. We love this city, we love our businesses and our neighborhood. We're not being adversarial. We want you to be successful. We are challenging you to do what's ultimately right for this area, for the neighborhood and for the city. The density, the lot coverage, and the height is inappropriate. We support development of this parcel. And let me say it again, we support development of this parcel. We understand your need for customers, but don't forget that the people in this audience have been faithful patrons and will continue to be your patrons. But we could accomplish much more if we work together on a development that we all love. Where I come from, it's considered professional to return phone calls, whether you want to or not. And for those of you who know me, we have a long-standing history of working with developers even before a pre-application meeting goes to the city. We spend hours working with developers because at the end of the day, the product is so much better when there's collaborative efforts and that both parties are happy about it. In spite of the fact that this group of residents was treated with contempt and disrespect at the Camelback East Village meeting, and in spite of the fact that the developer and their legal representative have virtually shunned us, we are still ready, willing, and able to roll up our sleeves and discuss how these two parcels can be developed in a responsibly guided way. Maybe it's a mini-me version of what's being proposed, or perhaps it could be a cool mid-century modern architecturally awarding structure that doesn't look like a cookie-cutter institutional development. One of the things that came up at one of the last meetings is precedent. Mr. Earl insists that this won't set precedent, but if you remember the map that showed all the R4 properties around it, every multifamily zoned property will now have the ability to request a PUD and double its density. Think about that. Every R3, R4, R5 property in the city of Phoenix will now ask for a PUD and double its density. Just last week, another developer had their pre-application meeting with the city for yet another PUD directly across the street. 
I don't know if you can see it on the map. There's a green spot with a white house, 1.9 acres, to build 81 luxury apartments on 1.9 acres. If you don't think this will set precedent, just look at 16th Street in Highland, which really has become a tunnel of high-density, high-height apartment complexes. We don't oppose what the people are coming up and supporting this are saying. We agree with them. It does need to be developed, but it can be developed. It can be a luxury apartment complex. It can be all the things that we want it to be. It just needs to be a six foot four person like Councilman Waring versus a nine foot, <laughs> a nine foot person. So please let us roll up our sleeves and work together. This is a great neighborhood. These are educated residents. They want the best for their community. They want the best for the city. We want our developers to be successful. We want our businesses to be successful. I am unhappy that the barrio and their fresh margaritas have left our neighborhood, and we don't want more of that. So please work with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Crozier, for that testimony. Patrick Birch, did you provide testimony for this council? Please come forward. Hi, my name is Patrick Birch. I live at um, 6125 North 5th Place, which is just southwest of there. Um, I'm a fourth generation native of Phoenix. Uh, my kids are fifth generation native of Phoenix. My grandpa bought his house on 11th Avenue in Northern uh, 1958 and raised his 12 kids there. I have 40 cousins, nieces, nephews, uh, siblings, most of who all live right in this area, part of town. So. If you want a fan of Phoenix, I'm that guy. I've routinely encouraged friends to move to Phoenix. Um, I talk very positively about specifically this area. It's one of the reasons I live there. I love it, absolutely love it. Um, you know, I joke with my kids, I drive around, and one of the things we talk about is, is architecture and development, and we laugh about, they probably would make fun of me by how vocal I get about not liking certain developments and how ugly I think they are. And you could ask them, and I specifically have mentioned to them multiple times, Wood Partners is one of the ones that I've said, gosh, that look at that development, it's a good looking development. Like it's not so in our face, it's they've actually done some things to make it look good. It's a, it's a positive thing for the neighborhood. So, you know, it's one of the groups that I would definitely welcome to come to, my, uh, to, come to our neighborhood. Um, one of the things that I think we need in this neighborhood is nice for rent stuff. The future of Phoenix is, in the future of, of America, to be honest, seems to be, if you read the articles, it seems to be smaller. We're, we're, they're renting, they're, they're, they're staying single, or getting you know, roommates longer, and they want to live here. I have firsthand experience of trying to help friends find places to live in this area, and it was extremely hard to find nice places to live in this area. They, that was, this is their number one area they wanted to live, and, they, and we couldn't find stuff. So I think that's you know, something that I think is, is very worth mentioning. Um, you keep hearing stories about wanting to work with us and that they represent our neighborhood and, and all this kind of thing. It, it's kind of funny, the one person who responded in the email was me. Um, and I wanna be clear, please give me a little bit more time. I think the opposition got a ton of extra time, but um, I reached out to Mary Crozier on the phone I tried to have a conversation with her, a very rational conversation. I was talked over. I was told later that I was pugnacious and rude. I have no idea why, because I, I listened to the conversation. I recorded it because I wanted to be able to go back. And I went back and I was worried. Did, was I rude to her on the phone? And I looked, she said I called her a liar because I called into question some of the things in the email that went around that were not true. She said, we double check, we triple check, and she scoffed at me, she talked over me, she later told me that basically I wasn't welcome to the discussion, if you wanted me to be honest. So I listened to the conversation, it, I, I was respectful, I never once name called her, I never once did that. And my point of bringing this up is I later went on to neighbor, uh, next door because I thought, she told me that there was all kinds of opposition. I wrote something on there that was simply an outline of the positive view of why we might consider this as being a good thing. I didn't call out any names. I didn't, didn't respond to anybody specifically. I just wrote, hey, I think the other side is worth hearing. I was called a snake. I was told I was no longer welcome. I was told, uh, called into question my uh, belief that my kids, or my sa or money is more important than the safety of my kids. Um, all kinds of stuff. One of the guys that I think is really worth mentioning said, you wonder why people don't talk and support. Because they're, they're vilified. 
the, and I, I went to a Halloween party last night and a bunch of people came up to me and said, I loved what you wrote. And I, I, I don't know I mean, these people. You any final point? I've, what we heard obviously talk about the merits of the case. And it sounds like there's a lot of uh, back and forth, but you've gone beyond your time. So I don't know if you have a final thought uh, so we can move on with those. My speaking. final thought is basically, I think there's all kinds of people who are working, who are moms, who are families and all that kind of stuff, who are highly in support of this, like me, who love Phoenix and think this would be great for our neighborhood. My kids went to MTA. I think that this is a great thing for the neighborhood. And I think there's a lot of people who would be in support of it who can't be here today. And I think, you know, they're, they're a little worried that maybe they, they're, they don't want to stick their neck out. And I, you know, I, I, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and on behalf of them that we really support Thanks this for kind of thing. Thanks for testimony. Appreciate it very much. How about Michael, uh, let's see. Um, Michael London, did you want to speak or did you want to donate your time to somebody else or did that, that person already speak? Donate, okay, how about anything with Roland Fleming, I believe, then uh, some of the donate cards time didn't get on a paper clip, so I just wanna make sure if they did wanna speak, you have a full opportunity to do so. R.E. Uh, Dolly. Well, yeah, oh, hey, help. <laughs> You're donating time, you don't wanna speak? No, I don't wanna speak. All right, good Thank to see you. you. I appreciate it. How about Toby Sexton? Also donated. All right, looks like Daryl Kriplian as well, donate time, Franklin Marino, donate time. Pam Fitzgerald, did you wish to provide testimony? Are you here, Ms. Fitzgerald? She's opposed to the uh, case for the record. Uh, let's see, Linda Colino, donate time. Brock Tunnicliffe, did you provide testimony? How about Ada Jacobowitz? Donate time as well. Uh, Stephen Grinnell, donate time. Claudia Grinnell, donate time. How about Lowell Justice? Please come forward. And then, and then Sean Severo will be uh, after that. I live in the neighborhood, and I, I walk to my karate class, uh, my dentist, and sometimes school. and. There, if this happens, there will be a lot more traffic, a, a lot more traffic, and I don't want to put myself in that danger. And I, I don't, I want to be safe in my neighborhood. Thank you for coming down to that testimony. Thank you, Lord. Appreciate it very much. All right, Sean Severud um, is in favor of the item. Oh, I'm so, okay, I apologize. Got in the pile here somehow, okay. How about Bobby Inman? Did you wish to provide testimony? <laughs> and then after Bobby uh, Inman, how about if, if Tom Gannon wants to provide testimony, that would be next. I am Bobby Inman. Thank you for the time to talk. Inman and Sons Auto and Truck <coughs> is at the corner of 7th Street and Stella. That whole cul-de-sac is pretty much a graveyard. Right now we have homeless sleeping there behind our dumpsters. It's dirty, the alleys are dirty. It's kind of a ghost town. To see this project go in there, I'm very pumped up about it. Our family's been on 7th Street since, I think I might already said since 49. And it's gonna be awesome. Nothing but improvement. I don't see any negativity. When I test drive cars leaving Stella, I don't have a problem getting out. And if I'm taking people home, I'm either going to Glendale or Camelback or farther south. So Marlette is kind of a dead, ave dead avenue to go anywhere. And Maryland too. You're gonna go to the bigger streets. But I think it'd be an awesome project, very excited. All right, thank you much for your testimony. We appreciate it very much. Is it Tom Gannon that gives one of the donate? Uh, or, okay. Uh, Marie Lisa uh, Trujillo also donated time. How about Denise? Donate. Donate as well. Mike Radcliffe, did you want to provide testimony? Please come forward. Followed by Feneri Panatakalops. I know I messed that one up. I'll do the best I can. All right, how about Mike, uh, Mr. Radcliffe? <laughs> 
Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council, thanks for uh, hearing me out. And I think I sent all of you an email. Did you all receive it and get a chance to look at it? Uh, we received a lot of emails, friend, uh, <laughs> on this case. Well, I, I, so for, this, I'm sure for the sake of time, I'm not going to regurgitate right. the email in total, but there are a couple images there that I want you to look at, right. and they pertain to a planned unit development that was passed and is being developed around my dental office at 16th Street in Coulter. It's a travesty what I'm going through. It is not aesthetic, and some of the visuals that Mr. Earl provided us when that unit was being proposed uh, are done very professionally and nice, but it, it, it doesn't turn out so nice. A lot of the landscape around our building now is dying, and what I'm getting at is these things just don't turn out as rosy as Mr. Earl and his developers wanted to. Driving up and down 7th Street is like driving in a Mad Max movie, and it's not going to get better. It will absolutely get worse if these things are allowed. You, you just have to think of the safety issue. You've got to think of MTA and Rose Lane and those kids on the bikes walking and doing whatever they're doing, but by, 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 by allowing 250 units, because the, that is the same number that is being built around my office, and it is hard to fathom these box towers showing up everywhere uh, in this town the way they are without any consideration to the streets and the safety of the kids, especially around these schools. Mr. DeSisio, you got a little different email from me, did you not, sir? Haven't read it? Didn't take the time? You're, I'm a constituent of yours, and, and you didn't I, get to I, that I, one yet? We all received a, a ton of emails. So okay, that, well, I'm I'll just make it real show. short. In that right. email, sir, yeah. I reference a statement you characterized me as. To an individual that was a patient of Dr. Snyder's, I'll finish, Dr. Snyder's and mine. And you characterize me as an extortionist, greedy dentist. Because I true. put a, well, that's an well then I'll lie. get, then I'll, then I'm me, not say so in the email, if you read it, let me finish, I'll, I'll, I'll listen. Happen. Okay, okay. Let, let me finish. Respond. In the email, after reminding you of what you said to this individual, just, I said I'd love lie. to get together for a coffee and let you meet me, because we've yeah. never met. And I'd love to have coffee, and you can hear my story, being born and raised at 13th Street in Maryland, going to Rose Lane, St. Francis, Brophy Prep, NAU. I'm a native Phoenician. I in, I'm, I'm in favor of development, not this one. But to say those things without knowing somebody is bothersome. I'd love to meet you for coffee. Uh, is that, would you be able, willing to do that sometime? Well, absolutely, but okay. you know what? You lied today. This was an outright lie, what you just said. It's just not Okay, true. then I'll get the individual's name, and I won't yeah. throw it out here. It's not a lie. And I got a witness to t listen to him tell us both, Dr. It's Snyder and I. You life. referenced us you, that way. Thank and you, Mayor. I would never have said that. All right, Mr. Radcliffe, thank you for your testimony. Um, I, obviously, uh, Councilman, you had a chance to respond a little bit, but any additional response uh, to yeah, this? Yeah, Mayor, I'm going to call it out when people say those kinds of things. It's just absolutely not true. It never happened. I know you were upset. The individual owned the property next to him and they had a right to build on it, and he wanted me to stop it. I could not have stopped it. It was illegal to do that. But bottom line is, he's not telling the truth. That was a, that was a complete. Okay, you you did not tell the truth today. All right, we have to move on with the uh, agenda. So they dealt with it another time. I, uh, we have to move forward. Tucker, uh, let's see. Would, next speaker will be Tucker Woodbury. I'm Tucker Woodbury uh, with Genuine Concepts and Mission Music. I promise to tell the truth. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, we own multiple bar and restaurant concepts all over the valley, and um, four of them within about a half mile radius of the Altamarlet project. Uh, we've made a considerable investment in those projects as not only property owners, but also uh, people that have adapted to reuse buildings and kind of try to put out some interesting projects that, um, that hopefully create um, reason for people to move to a particular area. In a, I don't want to take complete credit, but I think a lot of people in our space, in the food and restaurant business, the bar restaurant business, the concert venue business, are pioneers to a certain extent. And, and I only say this because we did the, our first Arcadia VIG 12 years ago on 40th and Indian School. And prior to that, there wasn't a lot of things happening from that perspective in that area. Um, same with downtown when we came downtown seven years ago and did Crescent, followed up by the, uh, the VIG Fillmore. Um, 
But what we're saying, what I'm just trying to say is that sometimes we make these investments and with the hope that projects like Alta Fillmore, Alta Marlette, and others will kind of follow, follow us and provide um, residences that um, attract the type of clientele that are not only good for our businesses, but are also good for the neighborhood in general. And I think if you ask people in the Arcadia area, uh, in and around that 40th Street area, or ask people downtown, or and, and people I think in North Central as well, um, you, I think that ultimately I know changes can be difficult and whatever, but it also can create a lot of positive things and change the complexion of a neighborhood in a very positive way. So, so just because I've seen it before, I've witnessed it happen in other areas, and I'm seeing it happen again in North Central, I'm a big supporter of this particular project and hope you guys pass it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Woodbury. How about Mr. Uh, Mark Hester? Donate time, how about, uh, oh, I mentioned the name earlier, I apologize, I passed it up. How about uh, Fenari uh, Panactopoulos? How close? In the ballpark? I'll teach you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Thanasi Panayotakopoulos. Oh, sorry, all right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, mayor and the council members. So I also, like a lot of people here tonight who have spoken, I've grown up in this neighborhood, grew up on 512 East Tucky Lane, which is just right, acro right across the way there after Maryland. Um, been here for 32 years. My father is, uh, has been here for 40 years, Christo. Christo's restaurant is directly impacted by this development. I live in the neighborhood still. My brother lives in the neighborhood. My sister lives on Maryland. And I have two kids that will hopefully be, you know, living here for 60, 60 years plus. Uh, we're huge supporters of the North Central community and we care just as much as everyone else here today. Um, but from a young a millennial's perspective, we need to allow developments like this to entice and have the future growth of these neighborhoods and have to provide these amenities that these people are looking for. And I know that the change is hard and the reality is our neighborhood was tree orchards and there was probably fighting then to build one acre houses, one house on one acre. Um, this is gonna continue happening as we have infill development and the urbanization that I'm in, in massive support of. Um, we can't be short-sighted here. There's been a lot of conversation about the density and I understand that point, but we've had, there's been multiple other developers who have tried to do this that have fallen out because it's just not economically feasible. And I think when someone wants to take risk, we should allow them to take the risk and do that to revitalize and clean up the neighborhood. Um, I've seen multiple accounts of vandalism uh, as I've grown up here and seen what they've done to the buildings there on 7th Street. And I urge you guys to support this development and I, I hope we can see this through the finish line. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that testimony. How about Willis Guerrero? I'll donate my time. Donate time, all right. How about Andrew Biskin? Did you wish to provide testimony? Afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I want to voice my support for the Alta Marlette project. Uh, I'm 28 years old, soon to be 29. Uh, young professional, lifelong Phoenix resident, graduate of Brophy Prep. Um, I'm very familiar with the North Central Phoenix neighborhood. Uh, I grew up right near 16th Street and Northern, and I currently live around 24th Street in Camelback. Um, it's personally been a joy to see all the positive development in the North Central Phoenix neighborhood, um, and particularly along the 7th Street corridor. Over the years, 7th Street has turned into a vibrant environment for folks all over the valley to work, eat, and play. I think Alta Marlette would create an opportunity for these folks to live in the community. And that's without all the burdens and costs and responsibilities of owning a home. There's nothing vibrant about the existing site. Um, the site consists of a large dirt lot, some old boarded up and run down homes. Uh, I strongly believe this project will have a tremendously positive impact on the surrounding community not only from an economic standpoint, but also from an overall lifestyle perspective, continuing to add upon the vibrancy of what is created in the neighborhood and along 7th Street. Thanks. 
All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Biskin. How about Erwin Pasternak? Honorable Mayor and City Council, my name is Erwin Pasternak. I uh, work at 745 East Maryland, which is the office building directly to the northeast of this site. Um, that has been my office building for the last 37 years. I've had my office for the last 42 years in this area. And uh, this site and this project obviously has tremendous impact on my office building and my office since I back up uh, to this project on both sides, both the west side of my project and south side of my project. Um, I've actually spent over half of my life in that building, and I know this neighborhood real good simply because I'm always there working. Um, this project represents a turnover and a progressive renewal of this area. Seventh Street is turning into a very dynamic, uh, uh, upscale, uh, exciting addition to, to the city of Phoenix. The new restaurants, the new activities, the young life that's being breathed into this area is a great asset for all of us who live and reside and own property in this area. Um, the project and the resulting activity will bring value to all of our properties in the area, help all of the businesses, and it'll bring new life to the schools, the offices, and our neighborhood. The most attractive part of this project to me is something that hasn't been mentioned yet. And that is that all of the parking for these units will be inside of the project itself. If there were lower density, they wouldn't have the economics to be able to build that interior parking garage. And as a result, all of the parking would be surrounding on streets and in my parking lot and other parking lots. Now that, that is a big asset for this project. Um, I see my time is up. I appreciate you listening to what I'm saying. Thank you for your Thank testimony, you. Mr. Pasternak. We appreciate it very much. Uh, looks like uh, William Friedman wanted to donate time. Uh, how about uh, Milt? Stamatis? Stamatis, yes, another Greek. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for spending time with all of us on both sides of this neighborhood. And uh, my wife, engaged this woman at Safeway on 7th Street, and they started talking because they're in the same yoga class. And the woman said that she lives at a state Antigua, which was the first PUD in Phoenix. And they gave up the views on the hillside at Squaw Peak to build those estates. I'm having difficulty understanding what we're getting in benefit. Trees and sidewalks and setbacks and an interior parking lot with 420 units. 255 units. It's a cabin cruiser that's cruising down 7th Street and parking behind Christos and going to drop anchor and it's never going to leave. And it's 100 cabins too many. And that's why we're here. Thank you. I thank you for your testimony. How about uh, Mr. William Saul? Did you, write, did you worship right testimony? And then uh, Mary Mulligan, if you wish to provide testimony after that. I've got. Uh, uh, Mayor and uh, council people, camp, count, council members, I'm sorry. Um, you guys can probably build a pretty good campfire after all these emails and, and texts and hands outs you get, but uh, anyways. My name is Bill Saul. I've lived at uh, 221 East Georgia uh, in Phoenix for the last 27 years. It is located in the North uh, Central Homeowners Association, uh, and it's clear that Wood Partners is outside of the boundaries of the North Central uh, Homeowner Association. Um, so I, just so everyone understands, they don't speak for me about what's going on in this project. The main reason I'm here is because I've received a mass mail and I've heard Mrs. Rich or Miss Rich uh, a statement about she doesn't send it out or it didn't get to me because she didn't send it to me. 
I don't know how it got to me, but that it has taken place. Uh, but the fact that these self-appointed ac uh, neighborhood activists uh, are urged by these people to oppose a, uh, the project and all other projects in the area, and I've heard counter comments to that today, but I heard it differently in two other meetings. Uh, she even urged people to wear the orange shirts, which we, we clearly see as a, a, a vote of support and union, uh, uh, so solidarity together. Uh, but it's pretty th theoret uh, theoretical uh, and counterproductive, in my opinion, about the revitalization of this city. Um, her email also talked, uh, talks about this one, uh, there's one story homes approximately to the bridal pass, large uh, lots, uh, which uh, frankly are not correct even in the North Central uh, Homeowner Association area, and certainly have nothing to do with the properties just east of 7th Street. This proposed project, I was going to say, I've been listening to the guys for 20 minutes. I think the two minutes I should be able to at least get my letter out here. Uh, this proposed project is 100% surrounded by all, uh, on all sides by buildings that are office buildings, retail, apartments, and that's why it's great for the infill location to have a high quality project. The email also uh, has nothing more than the misinformation of scare tactics. Let me quote from the email that I handed out to you. Neighborhoods are threatened by outside forces trying to change our neighborhoods and encroach upon them. Developers don't care and just want to make money. Development proposed like this affects our neighborhood character and property values. This beautiful project does not encroach even one step into the North Central Homeowner Association. So therefore, uh, in summary, um, these mass mails based on fear have no place in this process. Rather, just look at the project on its merits, judge it on what it has and its contact. This will create a precedent for others. I have reviewed the project, the elevations, and strongly approve what is there. And I hope that you'll get uh, urge the support of this project. I thank you very much, uh, thank Mr. You. Saul, for your uh, uh, testimony. Let's see, did Mar uh, Mary Mulligan please come forward? Good to see you. And followed by Mr. Scott Davis. Wood Partners knew when they bought the property that the underlying zoning didn't meet their requirements, but they bought, bought it anyways because the city dangled a carrot, which was the PUD option. The problem is that Wood Partners hasn't demonstrated their need for the PUD, and the city hasn't followed through in ensuring that they meet the requirements to demonstrate this need. Um, Mr. Earl has shown at every public meeting his proficiency in the use of smoke and mirrors, conveniently glossing over an obscene increase in density, almost double, from 130 to 255, that will adversely affect the neighborhood in many ways, and it goes against plans that have been developed that are supposed to protect the integrity and the character of our neighborhoods. Time after time, meeting after meeting, he, Mr. Earl astutely attempts to draw attention away from the elephant in the room, or the nine-foot man, if you care, and he chooses instead to focus on the design features that we've heard about today, like the beautiful landscaping, the interior parking, the generous setbacks, the suburban look. Um, he just did it again today. He showed us a slide with very lovely, very nice design features um, that the project includes that are not um, required by the code, which is great, but they're not a justification to get a PUD. Um, I believe uh, oh, yeah, convention zoning doesn't prohibit any of those kind of things. Um, I believe Mr. Earl has underestimated or perhaps misunderstood the neighbors who live near the site, as well as the 650 plus individuals who have signed online position, petitions in opposition to the project, the 13 neighborhood associations that have um, allied themselves in support um, of our opposition, and the citizen voters who I know have telephoned you, sent you emails, or called your offices. And I think you'll note from the comments on the petition and from the letters you've received that these are not cookie cutter letters. They are very informed comments, and they are very passionate. Um, I would like to emphasize again that the neighbors are not opposed to the development. We support responsible development in our area. We've done our due diligence, but our efforts to communicate, negotiate, and compromise with Wood Partners have 
fallen on deaf ears. So we were, are counting on all of you to bring about a fair and equitable resolution to the issue. And we would like you to ensure that our concerns are part of the resolution that you come up with. I would also like to point out um, from the, some of the previous speakers, several of them uh, happen to be property owners. That parcel is comprised of 13 that have all been put together to form the large parcel. And three um, of the people that have spoken in support also happen to be property owners, and, and I don't believe they stated that. One of them mentioned that there have been some failed projects previously, um, previously planned for that area that have fallen through, and I think that might be an indication that people are overestimating the worth of that parcel, and that would be something to keep in mind. And then again, several people who have spoken in support have, have um, made comments uh, that don't justify a PUD. And finally, Mr. Stevenson earlier today um, said that the staff supports this project because they feel like it's in keeping with the general plan. Well, I went through the general plan myself and I made myself a, a checklist. I believe it was 47 goals associated with the five core values and I made a checklist for what could be accomplished under PUD and conventional zoning. So I, I went through the 47 goals, checked off anything that could only be handled through PUD. I didn't come up with anything. All the, all the um, requirements and the general plan, as far as they relate to this project, could be, could be achieved through uh, the conventional underlining zoning on the parcel. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mulligan, for that testimony. How about Mr. Scott Davis? You want to provide testimony? Good to see you. Mayor, council members, my name is Scott Davis. I live at 333 East Pomona Road, Phoenix, Arizona. I am within the North Phoenix Central's Homeowners Association, but uh, they're not speaking for me. This is, this is coming from me, not them. Um, and by the way, I. I you know, Wood Partners, as far as I can tell, at every time they could, have gotten with the homeowners and been over backwards to try and satisfy them. They've done the best they can. Everybody can't be wrong. I mean, the uh, village was unanimous at the village. It was unanimous at planning and zoning. Oh, well, you have one dissent. Uh, at, at, I believe it was the vote was 12 to 4 at the vote planning committee and 6 1 at the planning commission. But go ahead. I'll That's majority. Um, they're now they're maligning Alan Stevenson. I mean, he's gone by the rules. The reason this project is dense is because it's offering so many amenities. The way they put the parking garage in, there's no other way you can do it. It's going to be a beautiful project. I've lived in the area 26 years, actually. The 7th Street is going through a major revitalization right now, and it's injected life into the area, and it's now taken notice of the millennials. All the cool restaurants and social establishments have caught their eye. They want a place to live, and this would be a perfect place for them to live. Wood Partners provides an upscale housing choice that is needed in this area, and is long overdue. We have been uh, abandoned in my neighborhood in North Phoenix. Uh, people have been going to Scottsdale, and I think this is a step in the right direction. Uh, I would ask you to take this opportunity to approve this and help revitalize North Phoenix and, and help with the, uh, the restaurants and the people on 7th Street that are flourishing now. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davis, for that testimony. How about uh, Mary, Z Mary Zarab, is that right? Zarab, but Zarab, okay, please. I do that all the time, okay. Um, all right. Um, Mayor, Councilman, Councilwoman, hello. My name is Mary Zarab. I live at 308 West Maryland Avenue. I've been living there, renting there for the last year and a half. Prior to that, I lived downtown Phoenix and it took me four months to find a place in that neighborhood to rent. And the reason is, is because the places that are available are on the first floor. I'm a woman, I refuse to rent or live on the first floor, and I'm sure you're with daughters, wives, you know, girlfriends, sisters, nieces, you wouldn't want these women living on the first floor. A lot of these places are just like that. This multi-story building is what our neighborhood needs. 
Um, I have a lot of friends that want to move to Central Phoenix because they love to hang out at all the places in my neighborhood, but they can't find places to live because everything is already has someone living there and they're probably never going to move out. Um, um, another big thing to think about is it's not 1970 anymore, okay? When you go find a place to live, unfortunately, the shower head comes about here. There's nothing new and modern, and there's nothing that, there's no washer and dryer. I had to negotiate with my property manager to get a washer and dryer to put into my, my apartment because they've refused to do it. Um, thank you for your time. I'm in support of this. And also, one key thing is what the North Central HOA Association says it does not speak for me. I disagree with what they say, and we need more millennials in the neighborhood. We need more young professionals there because that's what you guys have done on 7th Street, and that's what you're catering to. Um, so I appreciate your time. Thank you. Right, thank you very much uh, for that testimony. How about Sienna uh, Taros? Taros? And then followed by Zella Zanris, if you're here, you want to provide testimony. Hi, thanks for your time. My name is Sienna Tueros. I have lived in Arizona for over 40 years. I went to school at Xavier College Prep, and I've lived in the 85016 zip code for quite a number of years. In that time, uh, I do remember when 24th Street in Camelback was a, a pretty small, one or two level uh, kind of buildings, and since then, I'm still very happy to see all of the uh, infill, the renovation, the beautiful office buildings that have followed along with the Esplanade, everything up and down Camelback and 24th Street. I still live there. My property values have done nothing but gone up with this renovation, and I fully support doing the same thing for the 7th Street area. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Ms. Zanris? I donate my time. Donate time, okay. Uh, but you're po for the record, opposed to the proposal. How about Jenny Boltz? Is that the correct pronunciation? Jenny? Hello. Um, I would like to voice my support for the Ultra Marlette project. I'm 30 years old, I'm a young professional. I grew up in the area at 10th Street in Bethany. I went to high school at Xavier Prep. Um, I've watched this area change over the years only for the better, and I strongly believe that the Alta Marlette project will only bring further positive change to this area. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. How about Philip Ersenberger? Is this on? I live on uh, 10th Way, just south of Marlette, uh, just east of the property under question. I've lived there over 50 years in this neighborhood, and I think this is a perfect, a perfect use of this property. It's totally surrounded by commercial office and multi family. Those are the only single family residences on Marlette between 7th Street and 10th Street. So this site is perfect for an apartment project and uh, I think it's great for the neighborhood and for the area. You know, increase property values and uh, upgrade the character of the area. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Mr. Ersenberger is Helen Katsufrakis. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. All right, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm batting about one for 10 tonight. All right, how about Tim uh, Pickering, Mr. Pickering? Did you wish to provide testimony? Please, come, if you want to do it, now it's time to come forward. And then it'll be followed by Emery Smith. My name is Tim Pickering. I live at 313 East Rovery. I've lived in Phoenix in this particular area about 39 years, including the time when I left and came back again. I appreciate your time, Mayor, and your Vice Mayor and Councilman, and your attention to this matter. Um, I kind of have a selfish point of view. I used to work downtown Phoenix, downtown Phoenix for about 10 years and had a good start there. 
and the traffic congestion was just kind of uh, wearing on me. And uh, so now I work uh, a longer distance out on Northern Avenue at about 18th Street, and I have a faster commute home, although now it's getting longer and longer because 7th Street is so busy. I have this nice Google traffic map on, the, on my letter, kind of shows you uh, what I contend with on a day-to-day -day basis. I work with um, some software people that value their time tremendously, and so rather than working 8 to 5, they work like 9.30 to 3.30 to avoid the traffic. And I don't think this is going to help. I understand that there's going to be 250 units, maybe 500 cars. I saw a nice map of the garage. I don't know how many cars each level holds, maybe 70 cars, suggesting with two cars per family, maybe seven or eight layers of the parking garage. I don't know if that's right or not. So that's kind of a deep garage. Um, I had problems going up or down two floors. Um, so I routinely drive by this location, 17 Marlette, and you're aware that it's far more dense than the zoning allows. And um, it's a relatively small area. And I, I remember looking at the profile of the property as it would be built. Could we bring that image up? And this is supposed to be the, the view of the nine foot man. I haven't seen many of those, but I like to see the building equivalent. Do I have the button? I wouldn't know which one to push. Thank you. And, and I was looking at the nice, this is a nice profile, but it, it does seem out of place. Um, the building on 7th Street and Bethany, the red building that's also four stories high, also looks out of place. And maybe if there are lots of them, they won't feel out of place, but for the time being, they do seem to be out of place. Um, on the traffic map, it shows that 17th, 7th Street, going north and south, is uh, probably the most congested street already that takes, us, takes me to and from work. Um, and what else are we going to say here? Uh, one thing that is not addressed is, is um, say there are high school people that need to be bused to and from here. I'm not sure where the buses would stop and how that would impact. Another thing is uh, occasionally I get to go to San Diego and I'm a zoning over there and I enjoy the Mission Beach area when I can get there. And um, when they have traffic pick up, trash pickup twice um, a week in the summertime and there are these backup beepers all the time and I cannot imagine the, the massive amount of garbage pickup that would be required for 250 units and how they'd accomplish that. Um, I haven't seen, I, I don't know what's involved, but I'd be curious to know how they handle it because it's, it's uh, a lot of backing up in San Diego and a lot of beeping of trucks so you don't get much sleep on the mornings that they're uh, taking out the garbage. Um, let's see. All right. Um, this is all I have, Thank and you. I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you for your time and uh, your, your very informative uh, information here. All right. How, how about I'm trying to keep it as even as I uh, can? Zach Brooks. All my life, I wanted to be nine feet tall. Not sure what's wrong with that. Um, I want to I wanna show you a picture. Um, that's my grandson. He's the fifth generation of my family that's lived in this neighborhood. And, and uh, my son and daughter-in-law walked from their house to my house to go trick-or-treating last night. And it was an absolute joy. And I want to thank you and, and Mr. Stevenson for developing a city where they want to live in my neighborhood. And I want to challenge you to continue to take that responsibility. That's the neighborhood. That's what it looked like when my grandfather moved in to this place. And when somebody went, sitting in your chair agreed to turn a farm into that, he was very upset. But if he doesn't do that, my mom, who moved from the big city of New York, would never have come. Um, she, she liked this place. And that's what Phoenix looked like then. Um, that was my mom's dream house in 1962. 
Um, those were the restaurants that I grew up eating at. These are my four sons, and I'm very proud of them. They're all professionals. Three of them live within a block or two of, of me and this project. And my challenge to you is to build the city that my grandchildren, I have three so far and hopefully I'll have a lot more, want to live and grow up in and have their children in. Um, those are the restaurants that they want to go to. And that's where, that's the community that I would ask you to help us build. It's not that the, that the orange groves weren't wonderful, but this is where uh, my, grand, my children and their children, that's where they want to live. Um, that's, that's the housing that they're looking for. Uh, so I support this project and hope that you continue to do as well as you have in the past. I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brooks, for that testimony. How about uh, Sarah Spear? Is your probably testimony, Ms. Spear? She's Geo still here? Oh, there she is. Hey, Mayor, I'm going to go ahead and join by phone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just a moment. Down to four. Uh, okay, the two in the back. Okay, so we'll, we'll wait till they get back. One of them gets back. Okay, so no be problem. Okay, uh, legally. <clears throat> oh, is he got? Councilman Valenzuela is going to also call in right now, and he's doing a while. He's, so we'll get that taken care of. Okay. All right, so Councilman Valenzuela is kind of to stay a, couple, a minute or two or more while he gets the phone fixed. And Ms. Spear, as a school board member, you got to have a quorum. You know that. All right. Yes, I do. <laughs> so is there a quorum? We're here. We got five. Yep. Okay, okay, excellent. Uh, my name is Sarah Spear. I live at, near the intersection of Central and Glendale. And I am not here as an elected member of the Madison School Board, which, of which I am. I'm here as a private citizen. But I'm also here to share some information that I'm privy to as a member of the Madison School Board. Uh, almost 30% of our students in Madison attend MTA and Rose Lane combined, which are adjacent to this project. That represents 1,651 students. Last week, as you may have heard, one of our students was actually hit by a car. Thankfully, the student did not sustain any permanent injuries. However, we have had several near misses. Something else that you may not be aware of is that the majority of our students, uh, Mr. Uh, Councilman, DeCicio was talking about Madison and how what it is such a great district. By proxy, we have a large percentage of our students coming from outside of the school district. So as a result, over 40, actually over 60% of our students at Rose Lane are from outside of the Madison School District, which means their parents are driving them to and fro. Out of the 817 students at MTA, there is no school bus. So it is a school of choice. So all of those parents are transporting their children. I would like you to consider that our zoning laws as they stand are reasonable. I've had the opportunity to move away from Phoenix. I'm a native and come back, live in cities where zoning laws are lax or too restrictive. Um, I believe our, our laws are reasonable and I would encourage you to abide by them. And I would also like to leave you, since there's been a lot of conversation regarding millennials and whether or not they want to live in our area, uh, they do. However, it's not necessarily in high density real estate, according to BMO Harris Real Estate Agent Resource Center. The five millennial trends, two of them were, are referencing the fact that people do not want to live in high density areas. Anyway, and that is the benefit of our neighborhood. Thank you. All right, there, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Fear, for the uh, uh, testimony. I just want to make it clear that so you came as a private citizen, not that that information was not on behalf of the school district. I just want to make sure there's uh, without no confusion on that. There is no confusion. As you understand, as a member of the city council, you do not represent your council when you are out in public. I am representing myself as a private citizen that just happens to have access to public Got information. 
Thank you so much uh, for that uh, uh, testimony. Thank you for working with the, the city also on traffic issues. MTA, obviously, when MTA was built at uh, 10th of Maryland, we, as I was served on the as mayor at the time, we got a lot of concerns and issues, and I just really want to appreciate the school district working with us to the best of our ability to uh, manage traffic uh, in that area. How about uh, Mr. Uh, let's see, Ken Crane is opposed, but you is he still here? He wanted to donate his time to Neil. Donate his time, yes. All right. How about Emery Smith? Still here. <laughs> um, Mayor, Council, thank you for your time. <clears throat> I'll stop. Start by saying what I'm not. I'm not a native. I did not grow up here. I happen to be a millennial. Um, I might be the poster child for <clears throat> sort of the economic growth of Phoenix and that I came here from Dallas to attend ASU, met an incredibly wonderful woman who grew up just north and just west of this intersection. We now live a tiny bit further north and a little bit further west from where she grew up. Um, we have a nine-month-old son. We frequent all the restaurants. My dry cleaners is across the street. There's a dentist office around the corner. All of these institutions would not exist if it weren't for the community support. And frankly, I, I, uh, I'm of the opinion that the density of the proposed development is a function of the demand. And it's the millennials like myself who want to live in this area. I'm fortunate enough to have purchased a home in 2012, but I know plenty of people who would not be able to do that at this point to exclude those opportunities for economic growth for support of the business and to uh, improve and reinvigorate the very things that we love about the community by excluding potential uh, residents of the neighborhood I think is, is the wrong move. It sends the wrong message. The 7th Street Corridor, North Central Phoenix has a family atmosphere. There's walkability on Central Avenue, the bridal path. There is a strong sense of community and I think to uh, exclude potential uh, members of that community who just may not be able to afford to purchase a home at this stage is the wrong move. So I'm in support. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony very, very much. How about uh, Tommy McCone? Is Tommy McCone here? I apologize. Uh, he's in favor of the proposed project. Was, he had to leave, okay. How about Chris Kelly? Had to leave as well. Stevie Scotton. Hello, I'm Stevie Scotton. I am a young business owner, also a millennial. I live off 7th Street in Bethany Home, and um, I fully support this project. And uh, the facelift that the restaurants have given 7th Street are gonna go to the left, basically, because restaurants are going to fail if you don't provide a place for millennials like myself to come and move into the area. Um, and I support this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, how about as Clyde Grinnell, I guess, was donated time as well? Yes. Gigi George, did you, did you wanna provide testimony? Is Gigi here? Good to Thank see you. you, Mayor and members of the council. My name is Gigi George and I live at 1102 West Palm Lane, representing the Phoenix Historic Neighborhoods Coalition. We have uh, discussed this, taken a vote, and we were shocked when we found out that this proposed project was outside the infill or any transit district. It's a massive, intense, and dense urban project in an area where such urbanism is unwarranted and unwelcome. We have participated in planning for Phoenix for at least the last dozen years, and um, we want to say that this belongs in the Central Corridor. Uh, Councilwoman Williams and Mr. DeCicio mentioned transportation earlier. I think you should consider our city's investment in public transportation. 
before you vote on this, we would like to ask for a no vote because it's too dense for this suburban area. And the planning department, in my humble opinion, and others that I have spoken with, should induce developers to put development like this in areas where it will do more good than harm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. George. How about uh, Philip Scheinbein? Yeah, leave, he's opposed uh, for the record. Eric Bassingwaite donated time. Jerry Nelson, did you want to provide testimony? I donate time. Donate time, all right. Um, how about uh, Mitra Kazi? Mayor Stanton and council members, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you this uh, afternoon, or rather evening. My name is Mitra Kazi. I am a resident of North Central Phoenix. I reside at 5145 North 2nd Street, and I serve as president of the Madison Elementary School District Governing Board. Unfortunately, we were informed of this rezoning application after our October 17th board meeting, and our next board meeting is, does not occur until November 7th. So as a result, the board was unable to deliberate on whether we wanted to, to take any position on this issue. I wanted to make you aware of that. So as a result, today I'm speaking as a private citizen, but I have served as president of the Windsor Square Special Conservation District previously, and I've dealt with numerous zoning issues in the North Central Phoenix Corridor. And I've lived in Windsor Square for over 20 years and have seen significant changes to the area. In my neighborhood, and my historic district, many of my neighbors, as, as my husband and I, have made improvements on our home. And if we have followed all the planning and zoning requirements and historic preservation requirements required by law, although sometimes they were a pain in the neck and often they were costly because those were the laws and they were intended to keep the aesthetic of the, and the quality of the neighborhood intact to retain the values which benefit not only Windsor Square but the North Central Phoenix Corridor as well. I have found, however, those rules to be reasonable and thoughtful and also forward thinking. And as a result, I've always believed that rezoning requests should have a significant benefit to the community to justify a zoning change. I had a little bit of time waiting to testify this afternoon to do a little research. And in Madison, we ask our students to be lifelong learners, and so we try to to practice that ethic as well. And there was a lot of discussion about the housing choices of millennials. And in the past few weeks, I've noticed quite a few articles about this issue. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to read as well. And recently, I read an article in the New York Times by the well-known urban futurist Richard Florida, who I believe you probably have all been familiar with and may have heard him speak previously. And recently, he's written a col he wrote a column and opinion piece in the September 1st uh, edition of the New York Times. And the article was entitled, um, The Urban Renewal Revival is Over. And what he says is, uh, while many, if not most, large cities grew faster than their suburbs between 2000 and 2015, in the last two years, the suburbs outgrew cities in, in two-thirds of America's large metropolitan areas, according to a detailed analysis of the latest in census data by demo demographer Richard Fry of the Brookings Institution. Um, in addition, he continues by saying, two-thirds of people born since 1997, including those who live in cities, want to live in single-family suburban homes, according to a 2015 survey. That looks a lot like North Central Phoenix. It looks a lot like the neighborhood that I live in. It looks like what we're trying to preserve with these conversations today. So my question to you is, does allowing this rezoning and nearly doubling the number of apartments that can be built in the Alta Marlette apartment development a benefit to the community or a detriment? Is there really a need? I would argue that this rezoning application would be a detriment to the community, as it will create significant additional vehicular traffic in a neighborhood with limited sidewalks and two K-4 schools, Madison Traditional Academy and Madison Rose Lane, where our youngest students learn and, uh, and expect to learn in a safe environment. One of them is a school of choice, as you've already heard, so there is no bus transportation. Students are dropped off, walk or ride their bikes to and from school. As a result, I respectfully request that you deny the rezoning application. I urge you to have a forward-thinking perspective, just like our planning and zoning rules are intended to do, and respect and protect the value of our schools, our homes, businesses, and our neighborhood safety, while allowing the developer to build a project that will add value to the local economy and give more people a place to call home. Thank you so much for your time. I thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kazi. I, too, want to say thank you also for working with, obviously, when MTA was put at 10th in Maryland, you could imagine the number of phone calls that we received in terms of the massive increase in uh, traffic for the, for the neighborhood. And I want to thank you and the board for working with our traffic. That was not his own case, obviously, but working with 
City of Phoenix and our traffic department to try to alleviate the significant concerns of the neighborhoods uh, for the MTA in the, uh, in the obviously this very neighborhood and the amount of traffic it was at. I really Thank appreciate you, that. Thank you, Mayor Stan. We see that as a work in progress as we are continually working with neighbors I would agree. because that is I would, what I would we, agree. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so you. much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your concerns. Um, how about Stevie Scotton? Oh, I apologize. I'm sorry. How about Caitlin Penny? Okay. And then I have, oh, you're here. Good to see you. Please. Hi, good afternoon, sort of. Uh, my name's Caitlin and I'm a local business owner. I live in the neighborhood and I love where I live. I'm in support of this project. I moved into the neighborhood because I love the modern up and coming feel that it has. A lot of businesses have recently popped up in the area and I feel that the surrounding area needs more residential growth in order to keep those businesses afloat. It will also help steer the neighborhood from rundown and outdated into revitalized and full of life. I love where I live, and I think that all of the potential neighbors would love it too. I'm in favor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Penny, for that uh, testimony. Okay, I have um, numerous cards not wishing to speak, um, a large number in favor, and a, and a good number also um, uh, opposed as well. Let's see, Mr. Earl, did you, I don't know if you had any specific rebuttal you wanted to make. Uh, if it's just simply repetitive what you said earlier, no need, but if it's specifically rebutting any fact that you feel was, we'll certainly uh, hear that. Mr. Bob Ford, did you want to provide testimony? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Stan, I did put in a part. I apologize. Mr. Earl, we allow Mr. Ford go first, and, and Mr. I apologize. Thank you. I, I didn't, I don't have it, but that, I believe you. Things <laughs> good to happen. see you. Things happen. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Stanton, members of the council. My name is Bob Ford. I live at 338 East Tucky Lane, Phoenix 85012. If you look up on the slide, the A in approximately is where I live, okay? I have lived there for approximately 14 years. I've been a resident of the city of Phoenix for over 60. Uh, I want, I'm here as a citizen and a resident I do live in the North Central Homeowners Association. Uh, they do not speak for me, nor am I going to speak for them. I'm here to support this project. And one of the things that I wanted to state is that I'm kind of looking at a bigger picture. When, when my wife and I decide we're going to go out, the biggest decision we have to make is whether we're going to walk or ride a bike, okay? We ride, uh, and if you take a look at all of all of the redevelopment revitalization from Camelback to Bethany, 7th Avenue to 16th Street. It gives people in our area many, many choices. And it's, I think it's important that we support this as it's been presented to the uh, Village Planning Committee, to the Planning Commission, and as it's presented today. I think that we need to continue to support current businesses and future businesses. We still have a lot to redevelop in our area. Do you have any questions? Any questions for Mr. Ford? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Before I ask Mr. Earl for an opportunity for any, a short rebuttal, um, I don't have any additional cards, but is anyone else in the community here wishing to provide testimony on this item? All right, Mr. Earl, a very short rebuttal. Again, I'm asking only if there's uh, new information. Thank you, Mayor. I will be brief. Uh, I realize that there are a lot of emotions here tonight, both for and against this proposal. It has been a deliberative process. I want to emphasize that, working with staff and going to the village and the commission. They were both significant hearings with a lot of testimony. After all those things were considered, the decisions were in favor of this request, hearing much of the same things you've heard tonight. I realize that redevelopment is very difficult. Um, but in the end, we wouldn't have a lot of the beautiful projects we have around the city, including the downtown and 24th and Camelback, if the city council had not had the vision to see what things can be. Now, we've heard a lot about density tonight, that this is way too much density. Well, R5 on these properties would produce over 200 units. So conventionally, under, with the PRD, we could have very close to the number of 245, which we actually have on the site plan. We do a little bit different math than we've heard tonight. We think there's 157 under current zoning with a PRD option. 
but there's no question we're increasing the density. We don't want to walk away from that, but, but our feeling about this is that if you have a really high quality project that does not have a negative impact on the area or, and on immediate adjoining neighbors, it's a good thing to see a lot of in reinvestment come in. We think that there will be a ripple effect of good things on adjacent properties. There's been a lot said about traffic, so I just want to spend a couple of minutes on traffic. We studied this very carefully because we knew that there were 31,000 vehicle trips on 7th Street. And there was a concern that our people would not be able to make turns onto 7th, even though we eliminated all the access to Merlot and pushed all of them to 7th. The concern was, well, they'll go up onto Maryland and, go, and get into that school traffic. And we said, why would anyone ever get into a 15-car backup when they didn't need to? when they could make a safe left-hand turn. Now, we've been told tonight that you can't make that safe left-hand turn, and I, that's why I did the drone. I put a drone in the air three weeks after school started so you could see exactly what this was. And I know you haven't had time to look at it, but can I just guarantee to you that when traffic is stopped at the light to the north and stopped at the light to the south, it opens up an entire open gap of about 30 seconds where seven, eight cars can go out, and it happens every minute. Not, not every five minutes or 10 minutes, it happens every minute. So it's a very safe left-hand turn coming, and it's only that parcel. It's a very unique setting for that parcel. In terms of, you know, is this uh, too dense? Again, I, I ask you to look at the context uh, in terms of the precedent that we've been hearing about. This could happen on the west side of 7th. The answer is that would be against the general plan. It, it wouldn't be appropriate on the west side of 7th Street. It could happen all over on the east side of 7th Street. Again, this is the only parcel that's not adjacent to some level of single family. We're essentially more than a football field away from the closest resident, uh, and more than that if we're going to the west. So context is everything. The context for this is fabulous. It would add to the 7th Street corridor. It would add to people reinvesting in their properties. The one thing that's not in this area, of all the diversity that we talk about, there's beautiful single family neighborhoods. There's no question about that, and I want to preserve those. There's also 40 year old apartments, and there's maybe 10 or 12 of those. So th there's, a, th there's an ability to live in that setting if, you, if that's what you can afford. But what there isn't is a beautiful luxury project. Uh, and I've shown you the renderings both inside and outside. I just think this will be a fabulous addition to the area, and we appreciate your uh, willingness to listen. <laughs> I hope I've been short enough, Mayor. All right, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Earl. Actually, can I ask a question? Councilwoman, please. Um, the, there was a testimony about eight standard deviations different from the surrounding neighborhood, which is pretty significantly different than, how tall is the man in your world? <laughs> well, again, I'm glad you asked that question, uh, Councilwoman Gallego. We specifically did not design this project as an urban project. Again, because of working with the surrounding neighbors, the highest, the highest level of the building height, uh, excluding the parapet, which is five feet, is, is 38 feet. Now, a lot of the projects they're talking about are significantly taller than that. Uh, and that's why we had that three-story limit. We also set back 25 feet, not five or six or seven, which is typical of an urban style project. And the highest building height behind the three-story is four stories, not five or six. And it's only 48 feet. In fact, we could probably bring it down a little bit to 45 and 35 feet. Uh, so we're trying to make this work. And we, then we had all the units face onto and the things I showed you, the design characteristics, that are completely different than an urban style project. So we designed it in a, not as a nine-foot man. We, we designed it as a three- and four-story project facing on the Marlat. So I, I humbly disagree with the characterization of nine feet. I think the calculation was not based on the building height, but the number of units. Again, the, again, I, I, we agree we're adding units to this density. But again, if we're looking at conventional zoning, there's R4 and R5. That adds up with a PRD option to 157 units. We're 245. We agree we're adding units. But the question is, what do the units do? Do they create a negative impact? The only one I could think of would be traffic. And we've been able to show that we're a very slight increase over what's already there or what can be there under existing zoning. So again, we think that, the, that it's, it's how the density impacts. Uh, and we don't think there will have any negative impact based on its unique setting. I mean, if it were out on 7th, that would be different. If it were 
next to single family it would be different. But in its context, and that's the reason I showed the photographs, to show in its context it's almost, uh, it, it's, it works and it does not have a significant increase over the height when you look at it from the north or from the south or from the west or east. It, it, it's, you know, the, the buildings that surround it and the landscaping that's already there make it, a, make it work within its setting. So that's about all I can say to that response. I'm not a statistician, I guess. Any other questions for Mr. Earl this time? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank Again, you, one final Mayor. request. Does anyone here additionally want to provide testimony on this item? I want to make sure we err on the side of giving everyone the opportunity to speak. Sir, did you want to come forward and provide testimony, please? State your name and address for the record before you begin your testimony. Good evening by this time. Um, my name is Fred Selby. I uh, lived in the area, well, I was born in at St. Joe's 62 years ago. Um, anyway, um, the, it, to me, it boils down to two points. One, as my mom would say, hopefully this is acceptable in public, money talks, talks. And to me, it is all, it's about money. Um, you know, if, if they take it to three stories, they're going to lose X amount of income. It's going to, it's also going to, um, well, it's going to limit their income. And the, uh, the second point is if, if you allow a PUD, to in, uh, then is that not setting a precedent? And no matter where in Phoenix you go, it sets that precedent. So, and the guidelines that Phoenix itself sets out, it should not be allowed. Other than that, thank you for listening. All right, thank you very much. Any additional comments by anyone here? Here, I have some questions. Councilman, please. Al. All right, this is a question. Okay, so I'm gonna close the public hearing. Go for it. And then we'll uh, take that uh, comments and obviously comments for either Mr. Stevenson or uh, any member of the public who spoke or Mr. Earl on behalf of the applicant. So now officially close the public hearing. I gotta run the restroom. Thank you, Mayor. You know, so Alan, I have some concerns after hearing uh, the residents that live around there. Just the whole traffic safety and the value of how many cars we're gonna put on that street and also um, fire safety and will our fire trucks be able to go in and out or even a police car if school's being let out it's about four o'clock in the evening people are coming home from work um, what kind of can you explain the fire safety and also the um, traffic safety mayor councilman nowakowski um, the the project was uh, reviewed by the street transportation department. They did submit a traffic study uh, and that was approved by the street transportation department staff. Um, you know, I think Mr. Earls talked about the uh, ingress and egress uh, issues associated with that side and the traffic lights does make it a unique parcel where uh, passenger vehicles can get in and out of those. Uh, in addition, it does go through a uh, fire review by my staff within my department, by fire protection engineers, and they did not note any problems uh, with access by uh, fire trucks. And the other concern we have is, I call it the suicidal lane, on the suicide lane on the, um, on the 7th Street. So you have a turning lane that you won't be able to turn into this piece of property either in the morning or afternoon from certain times of the day. So if you're gonna add an extra, what is it, 250, five units, there's gonna be an additional traffic turning into that. Did we look into that? How would these individuals that aren't able to turn off a of 7th Street if it's in the morning or during the day because we have that reversible lanes at that time, what other entrances do they have? Is um, Maryland it's actually a turning lane there during those hours or how are they gonna actually be able to turn into their neighborhood without having a backup either way. Mayor Councilman Nowakowski, uh, on 7th Street when you, um, when in the, let's use the AM peak for example, and people are turning out, 
the uh, yellow reversible lane will be going south, so you would enter a, a vehicle lane of traffic heading south. Um, if you, it's the, the reverse of that and it's the PM peak and it's going north, you would be in the right-hand lane to turn into uh, that development from, uh, you know, from, from going north in traffic. If you were headed south during that PM uh, peak time, you would have to stay outside of the, the yellow lane to make a left uh, to turn in there, just as other uh, you know, development does uh, up and down 7th Street. So once again, my concern is that we have this reversible lane that's kind of unique to the city of Phoenix on 7th Street and 7th Avenue, and I travel it all the time going to my parents' house, and it's a nightmare. I mean, people really don't understand um, what the uh, reversible lane's about. You have accidents happening, or almost accidents also. So I think that's a, that's a safety issue that I have and a concern I have. The other thing, too, is that I'm not sure how many sidewalks are, that we have in that area. We have a school around there. I'm not sure if all the neighborhoods actually have sidewalks that connect to the um, school. And as we heard from the testimonies, even from a young child, that there's not enough sidewalks. Um, I never got that study. I, I really, I'm really concerned that we're gonna bring bringing in 255 units in that area and the safety of young people just walking to school from their neighborhood with an additional um, amount of traffic that we're gonna be putting on these side streets. Because I know that I drive 7th Street all the time and then when you try to make a turn, you always cut through the neighborhoods because that's the only way you can get off of 7th Street and go either west or east. So it's gonna, it's gonna add more traffic no matter what we do down these side streets. And how many of these, str these streets actually have sidewalks that connect to the school or not? Was there a study about that? M Mayor Councilman Nowakowski, uh, I don't have that information of uh, other off-site sidewalks in the area. Certainly the applicant is required to build their adjacent sidewalk pursuant to the law. Anyone who has developed recently in this area is required to put in a sidewalk, but in older parts of the city, uh, before the city had sidewalk requirements, there are portions that, that don't have sidewalks, and I believe that's what this neighborhood is comprised of in some of the single-family areas. And the in, how about the emergency in and outs? Do you have that study? available so we, I can actually breeze through it to make sure that there's access for um, fire trucks and police cars during high peak hours. Andy? Mayor Councilman Nowakowski, uh, the, the request was reviewed by fire protection engineers who review these all the time for the city and they did not note any concerns with that issue. All right, good. Lola, you're, I see you're raising your hand, so you, you want to come and give some additional testimony? I'll certainly ask you to come forward. It sounds like you have some thoughts as to the issue raised by Councilman Nowakowski. Uh, none of these uh, have sidewalks. I don't have any sidewalks in uh, my neighborhood. Where When I walk to uh, wherever I'm going, I have to walk on the side of the street. So this would definitely cause some problems. And if there was more traffic, I would have a lot harder time of getting right. to the places. Thank I you need for to your be. eyewitness testimony there. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, uh, Councilman Kowski, have additional questions? All right. Uh, so I said at the beginning that uh, we would uh, have the t um, staff presentation as to why Alan Stevenson and our planning department are supporting this uh, and the reasons why they think it meets the PUD uh, standards. Then we would hear from the public uh, and have the public hearing. Obviously, we had a very long public hearing. We closed the public hearing. Uh, it's Councilman DeCicio, it's your district. I don't know if you want to put a motion on the table, see if there is a second, and then uh, council members can uh, either ask questions based upon that or um, uh, you know, ask questions of Alan Stevenson as it relates to, um, to any motion you might make. Councilman. So let me uh, cover a couple things. One, this is, going to be a classic battle throughout the city and it's been happening already where you have established neighborhoods and you have properties and projects that are based for millennials that want to live in that area it's been happening uh, this is not the first time and it's not going to be the last time we're going to see a case like this the um, you know the fact that the millennials want to live in a home they want to live in a place they want to live in nice areas they want to live in places where they don't have to do any landscaping no maintenance 
that is what we're seeing across the city of Phoenix. It's just not in the central Phoenix area. If you think that's where the only place millennials want to live, it's not. They want to live close to where their family members are. They want to live close to what they, where they grew up in. Uh, North Central is an amazing area, and that's why people want to live there. And there's no doubt that millennials want to do the same thing, too. I'm going to put forward a motion. You know, if you look at this, uh, it did pass the Planning and Zoning Commission. It passed all the citizens-based commissions. That doesn't mean that they're not listening to you. It just means that they just have a different position. That's all it is. And they are looking at cases throughout the entire city of Phoenix. It's not just one case. It just hasn't been that way. But again, this is a classic case of where you know you have projects designed specifically for millennials, and you've got established neighborhoods. I mean, that's really what's been happening. Um, I'm going to put forward a motion to approve per the Planning Commission recommendation with additional stipulations. Um, there were other things that I didn't. Uh, I wanted to see more out of it. Uh, Neil, you talked about it. Their features, they are features, but I think that they need to be compatible. If you look at some of the other wood, pro you know, wood uh, projects that are out throughout the city of Phoenix, they actually look really good. They're better than most of the projects that are out there. Um, but I do want to add some more, uh, some more. Inf you know, I want to add more to this. Uh, on page 18 of the design guidelines, third paragraph update to require the use of brick accents on six architect architectural pop-outs at a minimum of a third and fourth levels. Um, I also want to expand the, ex uh, the architectural character of it. Bullets one and two update to require a minimum of 40% brick on the Stella Lane facade, a minimum of 50% brick on the Marlett Avenue facade, and to use the brick on the minimum of six architectural pop-outs on the third and fourth levels of the north and east elevation. On pages 38 through 41, I'd like to, on the Exhibit J, I want to update the conceptual uh, elevation to reflect the revisions as required in these stipulations. On page 16, table 3.1, the maximum density, uh, to reduce the maximum density units to 245 units. Uh, the, on page 16, 3.1, uh, the building height maximum number of stories replaced development standard with the following 35 foot maximum height for three stories, 45 foot maximum for four stories, and 48 foot for the maximum height for the internalized parking garage. And the building height standards shall not apply to the architectural embellishments at the entry. That's my motion, Mayor. Okay, that's the uh, motion that's on the table. Let me see if there is a second on the motion. There is a second on the motion. Now I'll turn to members of the council to see if they have any questions or comments on the proposed uh, motion. Uh, I'm just going to ask Alan Stevenson now uh, um, a little bit more detail. Many of the folks rep, uh, uh, expressed concerns uh, about the proposed project not being consistent with the City of Phoenix general plan. You provided testimony that it was. You can talk about that and then why you think this project is appropriate for PUD from, from your uh, perspective as the planning director. Certainly, uh, Mayor, members of council. Uh, the general plan, uh, as you know, was approved by the voters uh, and has a number of goals uh, contained in its entirety, as well as a land use map uh, that shows uh, future desired development uh, patterns. And within that, the general plan land use map does show 15 plus for this area. This is a very unique uh, parcel in terms of that 15 plus within this seventh uh, street corridor. And the, the general plan does lay out areas of village cores, as you know, commercial nodes and commercial corridors. Seventh Street is a commercial corridor by virtue of the amount of traffic that it holds on it, just like Greenway Parkway and Seventh Street, where I believe the gentleman talked about there's no more residential until you have to go all the way to Greenway before you hit higher density residential. It's because of those kinds of nodes and those things that happen that you see higher density residential happen in those areas. This particular one is uniquely suited from that general plan perspective because it also is buffered from existing single family residential compared to other ones like the one across the street that Ms. Crozier mentioned that abut single family residential. And that one's not appropriate for something this intense uh, of, of scale. Uh, and staff has said so when they came in and, and talked to us about the pre-app. In terms of the PUD, the, um, 
the standard for a PUD is you get to write your own development standards, and you're supposed to come up with something that is superior to what could have been gotten by the conventional zoning that is there. In this particular case, having a project that has access that goes out to 7th Street doesn't use Marlette for access. Prior projects that were mentioned and talked about all use Marlette for access as well and had, had access down there. So that's one of the things you get with this particular project. You also get to have internalized parking uh, that's covered and you get to have additional step back requirements because the existing uh, R5 zoning that's on a portion of the site does allow 48 feet of, of building height by right. The R4 portion does allow 48 feet of height, but there's a step back provision to get to that additional height. Otherwise, you're limited to three stories and 40 feet. They're pushing that four story back further than you otherwise could have gotten it in that R4 zoning district, thereby moving the height back so that it's not as visible. What you will see on the more immediate streets and areas is a three story building that four stories pushed back into the project and it won't be as visible. And for those reasons, that's why staff believes it's a superior project than you could have got through conventional zoning. There's a couple other things like additional landscape requirements and open space that's you know 7% and some change versus 5%, but those are the biggest ones. All right, thank you very much. I'll now turn to the members of the council. Any comments or uh, questions? Councilwoman Stark, please. Mayor, I, I, I'm very familiar with 7th Street and Greenway because that's kind of where I live. And there is a huge complex there, 1,222 1, units, and their only access is off of 7th Street. That's for sale apartments. Um, and I think we learned to coexist with that complex up where we live. I have a neighbor here shaking his head. He knows exactly what I talk of. And um, he, my dearest friend actually lives behind that complex. So you can make it work. And what they did in that case is the only access is off of 7th Street. They do have to make left turns. It does flow well. And, I, I, you know, so as far as the traffic, I, I feel kind of comfortable with that. I am concerned about not having sidewalks. So maybe as a conversation, maybe we should have streets get out and look at that, you know, especially if there was a, a, a boy hit there or, or I think you said a child boy. Perhaps we need to look at having some sidewalk access. Will they be required to construct in front of their property? Mayor, Councilwoman Stark, they will be required to construct a sidewalk in front of uh, their property and around their project. And they are doing an increased sidewalk on, on their portion. Um, and that is uh, pursuant to what we can do under the law. We can't require them to uh, you know, build a sidewalk throughout the rest of a neighborhood because that would be an off-site improvement. Those are in existing conditions that there would have to be some uh, you know, city uh, future bond funds, grants, something like that would have to be done to, to put in sidewalks in those areas that were built prior to us having sidewalk requirements. Thank you very much. Any additional questions? Any other comments or questions? Councilman Nowakowski, please. Here, what I heard today was that basically 96% increase in density when it comes to um, units, uh, when it comes to people and cars. And I heard very clear from the community that their concerns about the traffic safety and fire safety, I feel very, I don't feel comfortable voting on something like this unless we had all that information and, and gathered all that data and made sure that kids can walk to school safe, that the community feels comfortable, that there was an individual, I think it was Mr. Ford talked about riding his bike, and I'm not sure if there's even bike lanes out there. So, you know, if the, I'm not sure if there's even a master plan of how to develop this whole area and making sure things happen. So with a PUD, it's gonna be hard for us to turn down the next one that comes in, in that area. So if you grant one, how can you not grant another, right? So I'm just, I just don't have all that information, all that data in front of me. I wish I would, I would feel more comfortable, but right now I don't feel comfortable voting on something that has a lot of question marks on it for myself. All right, thank you very much. Any other comments by members of the council? Councilwoman, please. Thank you. I agree with Councilman Nowakowski. I think this is not something that should move forward today. We had some very compelling information from the neighborhood 
and it sounds like uh, from Mary Crozier and others that the neighborhood is willing to work towards a project that works for more people. It looks like um, it is possible to get a project that pencils out financially with fewer units. We got a, a great exhibit about other uh, Wood Partners projects in Phoenix that were on um, larger land and had fewer units. So it looks like there are ways to make it out work out economically. So I would certainly support a continuance if people wanted to continue to work on this. But right now on the underlying motion, uh, my vote would be no. And if Thank you made a much. motion to continue, I would actually second that as a secondary motion. I would offer a, uh, then a substitute motion to continue this item to the next formal meeting of the Phoenix City Council. And I would second that. All right, we have a motion to continue. We have a uh, second. The, I think the, question, the request was just to the next City Council. Till November 15th. Mayor, I'm going to support the continuance on this case. I, uh, I, I hear what Councilman Nolkowski and Gallego are saying on this. I mean, there are some interesting things that came out today. I think it was one of the best presentations I've heard from a neighborhood. You know, I do believe that we're going to have this battle throughout the city, and it's going to be constant, and it's going to be a situation where the, you know, we've got to design properties for millennials, but at the same time, we've got to design properties for a lot of senior citizens that are retiring and they're leaving, they're going there too. So I'm going to be supportive of that continuance for just two weeks, Mayor. Okay. But so my inclination is, I you know, I think they've done a lot. They've worked hard on the project, um, but I, you know, doesn't hurt anything to get a little more information either. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so the motion is for a continuance for two weeks. There is a second. The maker of the motion has agreed with, to support the uh, uh, continuance, obviously noting the comments that were made previously. Councilman Okowski? Mayor, just a comment. I'm, I want to let everyone know that I'm a very strong supporter in density, especially in the downtown area. And at the same time, um, Woods um, Partners have some great projects in my district. I mean, we just finished the um, 7th Avenue and Fillmore project, which was a great project. People very happy. They worked really well with all the neighborhood associations. So I know that they're a great developer. They're easy to work with. Um, so I, hopefully within the next two weeks, you, you all can sit down and, and really come to a win-win situation for the community and also for the developer. Thank you very much. Councilwoman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, since Councilman DeCicio is supporting this, I will support this, but I want to make a couple comments. Please. I have so many areas in my district that have no sidewalks. They all walk to school. We all walk in the street. Uh, it's the way it was built. We've conformed. Uh, people understand that. Uh, we have very few street lights because it was considered rural 40 years ago, and people didn't want the street lights. Uh, so we have horses. We've had kids hit. But we've also put in safety measures that really stress going to intersections, go to marked sidewalks, and follow the rules. I think it's very important that people realize, you know, I can remember when we first moved to town and we purchased a house just a couple blocks north of Dunlap. And people said, you moved way out there I can't believe you drive that far. My district goes to New River Road. You are inner city. And I understand that change is difficult, uh, but I think you have to realize density is going to happen, whether you like it or not. And when you can get a quality project, you should go with it. So, But I will support the motion. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman Williams. Would, did anyone else wish to provide testimony? Councilwoman Stark, please. Mayor, I, I would be happy to, given what's happened in my neighborhood with having the largest apartment complex in the state of Arizona, I've seen a lot of things that work and don't work. And um, if you don't mind, I'd be happy to put on my planner hat and maybe talk to the neighborhood. And Alan, but I know it's your district, Sal, so I don't want to step on your toes, but I have a couple ideas maybe what that would help with the traffic. So I. Deb, you and I are good friends. I'd love, I always encourage people to do that. 
right, thank you very much. Any other additional uh, 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 comments on the, um, uh, on the continuance? Uh, I, I'll be supporting the uh, continuance. Uh, the councilman who made the motion is in support of it and uh, wants some additional opportunities to see if we can reach a resolution uh, on, this, uh, on this matter. I will say, though, that I think in general this council has used good judgment in this um, uh, uh, area. Uh, although it didn't come to a vote, I am fairly confident that if the project at Central and Bethany had moved forward, that that would not have been successful before this city council. I can tell you I'll not be supporting any kind of rezoning on the northwest corner of 7th Street and uh, Marlette, certainly inside the boundaries of the North Phoenix Central Homer Association, which would go both against the general plan and the immediate uh, zoning in the, um, uh, in the area. And so it's up to this council to use good judgment uh, and, and you know, take each case as it comes and, use, and to use good judgment therefrom. I think in general we, we have, and I think when this case comes before us in a couple of weeks, We'll continue to use uh, uh, good judge, and I've actually been very proud to serve on this council. I think that that has been a characteristic of uh, of the city council. And I think that that characteristic will continue. With that, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. The motion to continue passes unanimously. Our business is not done. We have more items on our agenda. <laughs> Item number one nineteen is next. There. Are you going to have a presentation or can I make a motion? Councilwoman Williams, you may make a motion. Thank you. I will tell you, my husband, my son, and I are all NRA members. But after that shooting in Vegas, we had a long, serious talk about bump stocks, and we can see no legitimate reason for their existence. However, the city is not allowed to make those, an ordinance that would address this. This is a state and federal issue. I am pretty sure uh, we will be supporting legislation at the next session in Arizona, and I know we are talking to our federal lobbyists and saying we support that, and I think you're gonna see a resolution, and I would offer that we make a resolution to have our representatives uh, support prohibiting them. So the motion is to oppose the citizen petition, but to then request that as soon as possible we add support for legislation that would uh, ban bump stocks, be part of our legislative agenda, both at the state and federal level. That's my understanding of the petition. Distinctly put, thank you. I'll second that. There's a second. Mr. Leonard Clark, uh, testimony on that item. And then uh, followed by Reverend Moppin. First of all, love and uh, and condolences to all of the families and uh, of the, the, the lost people in Las Vegas. A month ago today, 58 Americans died by the Vegas mass shooter and Trump has done nothing. Oh, yet eight Americans, condolences to their families, died yesterday in New York City and we already are calling to change all of our immigration laws. Yet 30 days ago, nothing has been done. This so-called chief executive, 58 Americans, died by the Vegas mass shooter, and Trump has done nothing. Governor Ducey has done nothing. He talks. Talk, talk, talk. Show political courage. Tucson has caved in because we're always threatened by these demagogues at the Arizona State Legislature. Yet 58 Americans, that scene in Las Vegas was reminiscent, even worse than most battles that we've had in United States American history when Marines tackled a beach or army in Europe. So even the NRA has said that they would consider this. This is not some, I'm, I believe in the Second Amendment, but this is not whether you believe in the Second Amendment or don't. They shouldn't have silencers. This shooter was purported to have silencers shooting officers. I'm not anti-officer, by the way. I'm pro-justice, but I don't think it's fair that our Phoenix officers might be subjected to a sniper and not even know it. And our, Amer and our, our residents of Phoenix could be fired upon on a sk skyscraper with silencers, and we wouldn't even know it. That excuse that silencers are used for hunting or to prevent hearing damage. There's no excuse when 58 Americans have died. So I call on you to do something, because Governor Ducey's not gonna do it. Show political courage. This is not about Republicans or Democrats. I know uh, National Rifle, so uh, Rifle Association members, conservatives and so-called liberals have come together. This cannot be about politics. Let City of Phoenix show the country that will do something while our President Trump sits by after 30 days, 58 Americans died 30 days ago 
by this Vegas mass shooter, and he has done nothing. Let yourselves do something today. This is not the day to be afraid. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Wenscott, was I you have a card not wishing to speak. Is that accurate or not accurate? You did want to speak? No, but you just want to, okay. You're in favor of the uh, recommendation. Okay. And then next will be Reverend Jarrett Maupin. Good to see you. Good to see you, Mayor and Council. And I just want to say that I heard everything that uh, Councilwoman Williams said, and that is the consensus that uh, I have experienced in talking with gun owners and gun advocates that they think that bump stocks are probably the most ridiculous thing that's ever come, you know, out to uh, uh, enhance the experience of gun owners. Um, and after sitting through uh, all of my good neighbors uh, uh, fight over that apartment complex, I'm all about compromise. I'm tired, I'm hungry. Uh, but uh, <laughs> let me say this. Um, you know, I think there's some things that the council could do at the very least. I think a formal letter or resolution urging Congress to take some swift action, uh, that's the very least. Uh, and with compromise in mind, I think the, the most you could do um, is uh, an option that I didn't see listed on the paper, and that is restricting the sale of the bump stock to people that have a qualifying federal license for um, uh, to own uh, automatic weapons. Um, and to do so understanding that yes, um, it is contrary to what our state legislature has um, set forth as law, and to do so with the understanding that perhaps between the time that you did that um, and the time that the NRA might oppose it, which I don't see them doing, or the Attorney General might oppose it, which I don't see him doing either. Uh, Congress may get their act together and come up with some federal legislation. So while I don't like to see our city um, battle with the legislature on issues like this that are very sensitive, I do think um, that there's a window for the city of Phoenix to take a stance on bump stocks um, and even if you have to reverse it, because the timing of Congress is, is, um, is imperfect and, and causes trouble, you can do that uh, and avoid some of the um, uh, adverse effects of, of litigation. So I think there's some room for compromise, and I appreciate where you all stand on the issue. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Maupin. Okay, there is a motion. There is a second. Any additional comments by members of this council? Roll call. The CCO. No. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Valenzuela. Waring. Williams. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. So I think that is five to two. Uh, Council Williams' motion passed. Next is another consideration of a citizen petition as it relates to. Uh, monuments. Um, we have a motion on item 120. This, I think it was, a, it was a request. What was it? Maybe city manager, could you briefly, it's been a long meeting. Could you briefly remind us what the citizen petition was asking for in 120? Yes, mayor, members of the council. A citizen petition was submitted two weeks ago on the October 18th agenda that requested the city council to submit written correspondence to Governor Ducey to use his power in the effort to remove uh, symbols of slavery which are located within the city of Phoenix, assuming that's referring to Confederate monuments. It is important to note none of the monuments are, are owned, maintained, or on property of the city of Phoenix, but that's the request of the council is to communicate to the governor a desire to remove them. Okay, and do we have a uh, motion on that? No, and it, but at least as long as I have been mayor, you can imagine the number of requests for resolutions to be put on our agenda on in, important items, but items not directly related to the business here at the city. And I have resisted those efforts, and you have not seen those on the uh, uh, the agenda. Each of us have the ability to speak, use our uh, respective bully pulpits to uh, provide. Uh, our opinions on this matter, and I've certainly been outspoken on this one, uh, both as it relates to state uh, monuments as well as city street names, in which we had a thorough discussion and debate here recently, and I think we will in the, in the not too distant future uh, as well. So uh, that, so the reason why 
I'm not sure what the motion is going to be, but if it would be to not support the citizen petition, I don't think that reflects any individual member's feelings about whether or not we should have those type of monuments in our state or city. It's really more a matter of city policy about uh, resolutions that, that aren't directly city matters. Councilwoman, please. Uh, Mayor, I would, I would agree with you. However, I have the privilege of serving on the Governmental Mall Commission. I would be Congratulations. happy. Congratulations. I think, I think you uh, appointed me. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, I mean, I'd be more than happy to um, call the governor's office. But I think I agree with you. We have a policy. We've had a past history that perhaps we continue that. But I would be happy in, in my capacity to call the governor's office whether he listens to me or not is another matter, but I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Well, first, first off, uh, thank you for that uh, 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 offer. Uh, and so, but we still have to dispose of the citizen petition and we can, each individual council member can make comments as to that very generous offer um, as part of it. So is there a motion on 120? So I would, Mayor, move to deny the petition. Mr. Clark, as you know, we normally speak after a motion and second has been made under regular our, our regular order, if you will. So we do have a motion uh, to deny the petition as written for the reasons stated, which is that it's not normally our, our protocol to do resolutions on lots, you know, lots of things that come, be requests that come before me on uh, issues, knowing that Councilwoman Stark has said she would uh, make communication because she serves on the on the um, that particular uh, commission. Thank you for that generous offer. Knowing that each of us can speak loudly and using the bully pulpit of our uh, of our individual offices, and we often do uh, on issues that not necessarily are directly city related. So the motion and a second. The floor is yours, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council, and I do apologize to the mayor. It's been pointed out that I've been kind of mean to you guys and gals sometimes, and I don't Very mean fun. to, but that notwithstanding, uh, actually, I'm very pleased, even though I, I understand where you're coming from, I would still like for you to, to pass the resolution. Uh, I've been exchanging emails uh, between staff of the Legislative Mall Commission uh, and, and, of course, this other thing with the Jefferson Davis thing. But today I received, and you know, as you know, the original proponents there saying before anything can be done to change it must come forward. But this is within the city of Phoenix, and the original proponents are not here anymore. The governor's not going to do anything. The United Daughters of the Confederacy do not have an Arizona division as they did back then when they presented it. So I hope that you will pass a resolution, even though I know you won't. I do want to thank Council Lady Deborah Stark, finally, thank you, for, and I really hope that you will make public that phone call to the Legislative Mall Commission because you are a voting member that the mayor appointed, and now that the original proponents, the United Daughters of Confederacy, the Arizona Division is gone, they're not here. So the governor's excuse to withhold starting, and I would ask that you pass a resolution asking uh, this commission, Legislative Mall Commission, that the governor refuses to have his chairperson call into to coming into being. Ask him to do that. What's he afraid of? What are you afraid of, Governor Ducey? Thank you. Thank you for that uh, uh, testimony, uh, uh, Leonard Clark. Uh, again, each council member can speak for themselves, but I've spoken as items as related to street names. I don't think we should have any items of reverence to the Confederacy. In our, uh, in our city, I just don't think it's appropriate in the year 2017, and we'll continue to feel that way and speak out on, that, on these important issues. Sean Severu. So I'll, I'll make this quick. Um, uh, Mayor Stanton, you made uh, the point that, you know, you all have the power to individually reach out um, to, to the governor and to the state. Uh, the problem with that is that I don't believe any of you have done that. Um, and it's been a couple months now since, you know, uh, Governor Ducey has made the statement that he, he has zero plans, uh, nor does he care to remove any of the monuments, uh, or do anything within his power to do that. So for me, it would serve as a, a very impressive symbol if um, you all came as a collective representative of the largest and most diverse city in the state um, to come and ask the governor to do everything within his power to uh, 
to get these monuments uh, to slavery removed. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony on this important uh, item. Okay, so the motion uh, is to deny for a procedural reason, not on the, the merits of it, but because, again, throughout my entire time as mayor, we have not done resolutions of the matter of this sort, noting that each individual council member can say whatever they want now or at any time uh, as it relates to um, uh, monuments or, uh, that provide reverence to the Confederacy. Uh, and I think you're going to ha have heard at least from me, and I, now you heard from Deborah Stark, and you hear from more of the council members as well uh, on this important issue. So that's the motion. A second, Councilman, do you have a question or comment? I just wanted to make a brief comment. Um, Arizona was nearly a half century away from statehood when the Civil War was fought, and we when we discussed the naming of streets in our city, um, it was brought to our attention that most of the streets that were named after Civil War related or Confederacy related items were named during the Civil Rights Movement, so that is troubling. I don't think we need to honor the Confederacy in any way and have supported particularly my state legislature, Regis Reginald Bowling, and his efforts on this. So I will continue to do so, but we'll be supporting the Councilwoman's motion. Thank you very much. So any other Mayor, comments? Councilman DeCicio, please. There's not going to be any resolution from the council as a uniform as a city or anything else like that. This is just to deny the petition, correct? The motion itself is to deny the, uh, the petition, but I think it was a point that the intent of the denial was more of a procedural nature, not on the substance, uh, obviously. And so you know, each council member can explain if they're going to support it or not and the reasons why. But uh, obviously the intent was to make sure that there's no misinterpretation as to supporting this, uh, this uh, procedural decision as to not using resolutions of this council as a way of doing business, which we haven't done. Doesn't mean that people don't feel strongly on the substance of the issue of eliminating uh, monuments that provide reference to the Confederacy. Other uh, comments or questions? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Waring, Williams, Mayor Stanton. Yes. Uh, so those are, that's all the uh, formal business. There were still some additional citizen comments that we have. And uh, I told those individuals if they were to stick around, and some did, that they'd have the opportunity to speak now. Mr. Leonard Clark, did you provide citizen comment on non-agendized items? If it's an agendized item, you had your shot. Thank you, Mayor and Pardon. Council. My name is Leonard Clark. Um, I saw a nine-foot man walking by, just joking. Aww. It's getting kind of corny by now. Um, as you all know, you know, because I know some of you will be here, some of you might be leaving the position. I just want you to know that I, it doesn't matter what I think, but it matters to me what I think, but even though we've disagreed, I don't hate you because I've learned that hate is very destructive. And I, even though I disagree with you, Republicans uh, and you know Democrats, whatever you are, I don't care. You've put up with me for many years as a citizen, but I, I am still going to just let you know that my good friend and human rights activist Joanne Woods is going to present our petition to you, the citizens' petition. This one is compromise. She's going to present it. It's got a compromise on it about a, uh, a oversight board for the Phoenix Police. And let me just say, I want to thank the police. Today they handled a hostage situation. They've been putting their lives on the line. They lose their lives. But in order to strengthen the trust of the people, some people say, Leonard Clark, who the heck are you? There's no lack of trust. Yes, there is. There's cynicism going on now. I want our officers to be even safer so that citizens will know there is justice. The officers will know there is justice. Perhaps Joanne Woods and uh, my fellow human rights activists can work with the Phoenix Police Department and the Phoenix Police Union Instead of demonizing each other, why can't we work together? I know my conservative friends will probably vote no again. Um, you know, I mean, you've already voted no on silencers. You know, <laughs> they are used to help kill police officers and on the whole Confederate thing. I don't care. I think you guys are nice people. You know, I'll get, a, I'll get razzed for that by the politics. I don't care. You know me. I just tell you how I feel. That's why I'm not sitting up there because you can't talk like I do and be a politician. You can't. But I thank God, and in deference to my atheist friends, for the fact that I can stand here and I can talk to you in the fifth largest city in the United States of America, because what I'm doing right now, I could literally, I'd be, I'd be decapitated. I'd be put in prison in many countries. So I do believe in our system. But 
I also believe when power gets too cor powerful, pe powerful people become too powerful, they can be corrupted. I'm not saying you. And that's why I believe it is more important than ever for citizens to speak up. And I want to thank the po Phoenix Police Department. Condolences to all of those who've lost their lives and put their lives on the line every day. But I, we need to have some type of review board. There could be compromise. It's not just myself. Let's restore some trust because uh, we have plenty of enemies. So thank you so much for letting me speak. And I don't know what I'm going to do when the mayor's gone. All right, I'll let you guys go. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Clark. Uh, you set her up, so Joanne Scott Woods, bring us the petition. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. I uh, just had dental work, so I'm going to try my best to enunciate. Um, I'm submitting this uh, petition for the implementation of a civilian review board. Um, my request is, or Lynn's and my request is, within two months of the acceptance of this petition, a panel co will convene to study the work compiled by Assistant City Manager on best practice models and costs for a civilian review board. And all of you know the background uh, of this. I won't go into it, but I think the bottom line is that uh, according to the city manager at Zucker, uh, the CPTI is now in sunset, and he has no authority to move forward on this item. The third part of my um, petition is on panel composition and selection. Um, the panel will be composed of four Phoenix residents, four Phoenix Police Department community relations officers, City of Phoenix Attorney Brad Holm, and Assistant City Manager Milton Dehoney. The four Phoenix residents will be chosen from a list of community volunteers, leaders, human relations, commission commissioners, and independence by the city manager. And the Phoenix Police Department community relations officers will be chosen by the executive assistant chief, Michael Kurtenbach. The fourth part is the timeline for the results on the best practice model and cost. Within six months of being convened, the panel re will provide a report on best practices, models, and cost. The timeline for presentation um, immediately uh, in, sex in uh, subsequent meetings following the report's completion, details will be presented for discussion to the City of Phoenix Human Relations Commission, the Public Safety and Veterans Subcommittee, and the Mayor and City Council and the timeline for funding after the determination by the panel and consideration by the city manager, funding will eventually be included as an item for adoption during the 2019-2020 city budget process. And this is respectfully submitted to you by Lynn Clark and Joanne Scott Woods. Thank you so much. Thanks. Next, is Stephen Edwards still here? Was he able to stay till the end? He had to leave, unfortunately. How about Mr. James Dibler? Good to see you. I am back. I'm welcome back. Good to see you. Hello, I am James Dibler. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, in Council District 5. I have issues about 43rd Avenue bus route running late every morning. When I get to the bus stop at 43rd Avenue in Glendale, the bus driver was running 10 minutes late due to the traffic on Grand Avenue and picking up bus passengers. I would like to see Phoenix Public Transit Department to improve on-time performance and increase time currency on 43rd Avenue to make sure I have a high school 
and Glendale Community College students don't be late to work in school. I am suggesting that 43rd Avenue bus route should be operated by Phoenix South Garage because it's closer to the garage than 79th Avenue and Van Buren Street. Last week, I studied the map on Google to make sure that 43rd Avenue bus route to be operated closer to the garage. I found out that Phoenix West Garage currently operate 43rd Avenue bus route. The garage is 5.6 miles from 43rd Avenue and Black Guy Road that serves as a starting point for the bus route. The Phoenix South Garage is five point is three point seven miles from third forty third Avenue and Back Eye Road. It's just m like my suggestion for April two thousand eighteen bus changing schedule. Forty third Avenue to operate fifty minute frequency for people don't get to work late. Phoenix. South Garage will focus on 43rd Avenue bus route, while Phoenix West facility focuses on 8th Avenue bus route. Last week, I missed the city bus on Knee Hills Drive trying to go to work due to the late on time performance for body by Phoenix West facility. Instead, I took a lift to work, so, so I would not be late at my job. I got the bus at 43rd Avenue and down like to take a lift to work. Thank you for my time consideration. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dibler. Appreciate Here's that. Here's a copy of the map. Thank you. How about uh, Tom Simon? Did you provide testimony? Is Tom still here? Oh, great to see you. Please come forward. Mayor and council people, uh, thank you. I represent uh, the Shushan Palace Restaurant in the Chinese oh, Cultural Center. Also, uh, Charlie Lay, Super L Ranch Market, and the uh, Chinese United Group. I wanted to do, uh, just to take a couple of minutes and update you on some things that are of concern uh, to the Chinese Americans. Uh, first of all, I want to say to the ones that have been able to stay, it's three to nothing, Houston in the third. <laughs> so it's, a, it's appreciated that you're able to stay through the World Series, game seven. <clears throat> but uh, it really is a pleasure to represent these folks in this battle. Last time they were before you, a little over a month ago, you encouraged True North to get together with the Chinese United Group and regretfully after that, True North went on a campaign to try and prove that the Chinese Americans could not come up with the funds to purchase. Uh, you may have seen in the newspaper a column by Abe Kwok in which he uh, questioned uh, the, uh, the community saying, where's the money? Well, I want to report to the city council so that you know that last week a Chinese businessman flew from China to Phoenix with bank records representing over $155 million in net worth and worked with Councilman DeCicio to try and arrange a meeting with True North. And uh, we almost got there. They sat there at the, these Chinese businessmen, sat there at the, air, at the airport at the Crown Plaza for two days, supplied all the information that True North asked for, but True North never rang their phone and never showed up to meet. So when they say to you the next time that they're open to good dealing, good faith dealing, I don't think so. You don't travel all the way from China with all the financial backing that you need and then not get a meeting. The second point that I want to bring up, if we could, the Chinese Americans are very disappointed 
that yesterday the planning department decided to issue a permit to allow True North to uh, dismantle the roof, the iconic tiles. Now, I know that it's their thought that they couldn't do anything differently, but you must understand and understand why the Chinese Americans are upset about this, is that this is a condominium property. And there are two owners to the condominium property. One of them is True North. The other one is the Sushan Palace restaurant, who I represent. They said they don't want this permit issued. True North said they did. And the question to the city council is, why would you choose one owner of property over another? The condo association never asked for a permit, and they are the proper venue to do so. Based on that, they've asked you in writing today uh, through email to rescind that permit because it was not properly attained, that the only person that, person that can really ask for that permit is the condominium association, not an individual owner like True North. So we, we want to make that clear. I'd like to, I would love to hear what uh, you folks have to say about that. I, I guess the planning director is no longer here, unfortunately. Uh, but it is very disturbing to the Sushan Palace restaurant. Excellent. Your time is up, but I will, I will ask for this. Um, you, you know, you have framed this as a policy choice by this council mm -hmm. as opposed to the legal restrictions. I'll ask our city attorney maybe, you're, you're, are you legal counsel for the no, restaurant? No, I'm not legal counsel. I'm sorry. No, I'm public. I apologize. I'm the, I'm the public maybe our legal director. counsel then can get with you right afterwards and explain the legal scenario under which we um, uh, uh, operate. And obviously, if, well, yeah. if, if I'm sorry, I, I can't talk subsequently because this is a non-agendized item. So all I can really do is direct our city attorney to get with you immediately after this meeting to talk through the legal issues that the, for the dilemma that all of us are facing under these under these circumstances. So I'm going to ask him to do that immediately. And legally, I can't go beyond that because this is a non-agendized item. I do not want to be in violation of the open meeting law of the state of Arizona. Fair Thank enough. you so much, Mr. Simon. Thank you. For all right. How about Sheng ZQ, ZQ, Zhang Shi Qi, excuse me. Hi, my name is Zhang Suqi. Ah, darn it. I appreciate it. Close. Um, I just want to make a couple of points and be brief about this. It's my understanding, and I think it's fact, that the CCC was built for public use and not for private use. There's signage out on the freeways that say it's a Chinese cultural center and not a market or a building or an office building. And we all know that the uh, architecture is very accurate, artistic and beautiful, and the materials used for that structure were imported from China and can't be replaced. So I would like to make the analogy of the absurdity of what's going on by showing a picture of a tree. The city helped preserve this tree at 12th Street in Northern. Here's another tree at uh, First Street and McKinley, which was preserved by the city. The tree can't speak for itself. It had to have almost five people come out in each case to preserve the tree. We've got 20,000 people that want to preserve this. Sorry the pictures are very bad, but the point is we all love trees, and our community loves this place. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, testimony. Uh, let's see, Jeff Spellman, are you still here? Uh, Mayor, members of the council have a petition to present. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Jeff Spellman. I'm with uh, Take Action Phoenix, uh, Mayor members of the council. Take Action Phoenix is an organization comprised of residents from many neighborhoods across the city of Phoenix. For four months after the introduction of text amendment ZTA 22-08 to update the city of Phoenix ordinance regulating group homes, 
Members of TAP worked with the Planning and Development Department to support correction of the text that affects persons who live in group homes in residential neighborhoods. TAP supported passage of the updates that were passed by the City Council on June 21st, 2017. We did that with the understanding that a complete new ordinance would be in place by 2017. We've been working at the direction of the DAEI subcommittee, uh, asked that planning development um, create a working group. TAP has been actively participating in that all summer. We've been a little bit frustrated with that process in that essentially we've spent all summer hearing from different city departments, organizations about all the things that they cannot do. Not moving the ball forward on what could be done to correct the situation. The challenge is the City of Phoenix lacks following or is experiencing the following issues that may make it difficult to reach a deadline by the end of the year. Number one, there's a lack of an accurate database or maps to show the location of group homes. Two, the zoning ordinance does not adequately address group homes with 10 or more residents. Three, there's actually an error in ordinance G-6331. Uh, the ordinance was passed up by you on June 21st and it was published incorrectly in code publishing uh, with a serious er error that should be corrected in a public hearing process with action by the city council. There's a lack of a public hearing process for applications uh, for group homes and reasonable accommodations. So with that, we have a two-pronged and or uh, petition request. One, take action Phoenix respectfully requests that the city council immediately place a temporary hold on approval of applications for group homes and the approval of disability accommodation applications for 90 days or until the new ordinance is enacted. We've talked to most all of the council members about this and we understand that there is hesitation in that. Um, one of the best things that come out of the working group meeting this summer is the fact that you hired the nation's best expert on this, on group homes, Daniel Lauber. He has some concerns about this. We think the idea of, of a, uh, uh, a hold on uh, processing applications is different than the other cities. Uh, so with that, we're providing what we're asking for perhaps and you would consider an alternate request. Number one, it's an, it's an effort to speed things along and to have a clear roadmap on where we're headed with this thing. And so what we're asking as an alternate, if you don't want to enact essentially a moratorium, is to one, have the planning department create a framework that's needed to create the new comprehensive ordinance, create the framework for revising the zoning ordinance for separation, identify the city departments that would need to be involved in implementing the licensing process and related zoning changes, present a timeline so that we know exactly when to expect this to happen, create a timeline for implementing an approved ordinance with the various subsequent steps that are needed to implement it once the ordinance is passed, and finally, and this is probably the most important thing, this message is for our city manager, Mr. Zerker, um, we've already heard that this is going to require multiple city departments working together to make this happen. I have to praise Alan Stevenson and his staff. They have worked very, very hard with us and very, very accommodating to have good open communication about getting this job done. What we're hearing is that uh, this is gonna require multiple city departments and maybe not all of the other departments are on board with this. So once we have the framework, the timeline, we really need your support to get the other city departments on board with the framework and timeline that the planning department puts together to make this happen. All right, we thank you very much, uh, Mr. Spellman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the compliments uh, for Mr. Stevenson. He took some good body blows earlier, so it's good to uh, pump him up a little bit uh, for this one. All right, uh, how about Pascal Labadi? Mr. Mayor, how are you? Great. And everybody else. I coming up here all the time because it's that uh, we have uh, some uh, people here in the city of Phoenix. Then I belong to work with the city of Phoenix because it's, uh, they should not go should not go on the on the back uh, back door and uh, support uh, the criminals. We have a. Uh, would you give this here, please? Um, it is a two and a half, a two, a two years and uh, ten months that uh, Ricardo Zelaya 
the owner of uh, the uh, Clinica La Familia, 1533 uh, East Valletta Street. Uh, they demolished the house and the, the, they paved the lot, they're parking in there, and this uh, city didn't do nothing about it. Now, there is one thing that should be done because is that, uh, this is not a, a, a freeway where he's got uh, access now. They started there at the 7 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock at night. And what they're doing in there, people come at night, they probably give it uh, 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 food stamps, um, insurance, and the money to those people who work in their time, and they go collect uh, uh, money from the, uh, the, the government. We are paid for those people there. I am very sorry for people who really need the money, poor people. You know, I take my heart and I give it to them, but I do not gonna give it to the people who work. And that, uh, so therefore, I motion this, this um, city council here to stop this clinical uh, La, La Familia to parking on the uh, lot on the 1529 East Valletta Street. They, in the, in the city, uh, they said uh, that in the May 10, they stated that uh, the um, Clinical La Familia, they must remove the driveway on the lot 1529 East Valletta Street and the landscape on 25 feet reduce the uh, block the, the, uh, the, uh, the exit to the alley and have uh, the cars go to the parking lot uh, through the main uh, uh, clinic, but the R5 um, zoning. So I believe that uh, this council should stop Thank you. those people to go parking in there anymore until uh, they come to a compliance. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, to all of you, have a nice day, and the Lord God bless you all. Thank you so very much. Anyone else here wishing to provide testimony? Any other citizen petitions? <laughs> We're adjourned. <laughs>